my gentle and of course very modern apes, being wrong about something sucks. Everybody is wrong about something sometimes, we're only human after all, and yet despite the fact that it is a universal experience, it doesn't really make it hurt any less, does it? In fact, psychological studies have shown that being wrong about something, or being shown that one is wrong about something, a type of social pain, actually lights up the same region of the brain that responds to physical pain. That fact alone probably explains the phenomena where when people are shown to be incorrect about something, they tend to double down on their original belief rather than just own up to being wrong. That's disappointing and also pretty problematic for us as a species, to be honest, because admitting that you've made a mistake is kind of imperative for the next step, which is fixing that mistake, moving forward and learning from it. My name is Erica or Gutsit Gibbon here on YouTube, and today I want to talk about a few people. I want to talk about some creationists, including Robert Carter and Jeffrey Tompkins. I want to talk a little bit about myself, and I want to talk about what it means to be wrong. Before we get too into this, I'm going to give a little snark and joke warning for those sensitive creationists out there who think that I'm too mean in my videos. Oh, boo-hoo! Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. If you thought that Mr. Krabs joke was too much, you're gonna want to get out of here, because that's just base-level sassiness for what we're gonna be doing in this video. I'm very happy to say I have been working hard to be better in regards to talking badly about other people. And I know it takes time, but I am figuring things out, and I can confidently say that I already have gotten a lot more detailed with my insults. Every so often I get someone who asks me, why do you put so many, like, memes and jokes and clips in your video? You'd be taken much more seriously without them. And my answer to that is, like, this is YouTube, you guys, right? This is not where serious scientific debates are taking place. That arena is, believe it or not, the literature. So reason number one why I have jokes in my videos, even the ones that are like presenting arguments, is because this is YouTube and I want my videos to be entertaining and fun to watch. That way I can trick people into learning. And the second reason is I think it's fun and funny to put those kinds of jokes in my videos. This is my YouTube channel. If I want to put surreal memes in my debunk of Jeffrey Tompkins and in this one Rob Carter, then I'm going to do that and no one can stop me. My life, my rules, my style, my attitude. You love me or hate me, I don't care. I can explain that meme to you too if you want, Rob. In fact, any of these, just shoot me an email. That's a given at gmail.com. I'll walk you through it. Uh, she called um, Tompkins my brother in Christ. She called me that also. Um, Erica, I don't know if that's sarcastic or if you're actually calling on the name of Jesus. It's a meme, Dr. Carter. It's just a joke. I'm yanking your chain. I promise I am not chastising you in the name of Jesus. Truly. Heads up though, you can expect more snark and more jokes in this video. I put the warning in in part for you, just so you're aware of the tone of this thing. That will not stop me from dissecting almost line by line your entire series that is more or less about me and my work on Jeffrey Tompkins though. So rest assured, we will be covering everything. Whew, zooey mama. With that little preamble out of the way, how about I catch you guys up on the story so far? So a couple months ago, gosh, it's almost been a year now, I released a video on the work of a one Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, a geneticist who has kind of put out this series of articles over the course of a decade nearly, explaining why humans and chimpanzees are not as similar, genetically speaking, as secular science would have you believe. The secular numbers are around 99% for coding base pairs, and about 95-96% when we're taking the entire genome into account. Now obviously, Jeffrey Tompkins and Rob Carter, who we're talking about today, they're both young Earth creationists who believe that God created the Earth more or less in its present state, and that all of the modern biodiversity results from these sort of archetypal kinds that God created in the beginning of everything, and humans are created special and unique, physically too, I guess. As such, humans cannot be related to other apes, nor did they descend from other apes, and that's why Jeffrey Tonkin seems to have spent so much time on, like, debunking this one relatively simple secular statistic. 
From around 2011 to 2018, Jeffrey Tompkins released several papers published in the Young Earth Creationist Journal, the Answers Research Journal, which of course has no peer review by secular science, that is detailing what the actual similarity between humans and chimpanzees is. Genome-wide DNA alignment similarity for 40,000 chimpanzee DNA sequences queried against the human genome is 86 to 89 percent. How genomes are sequenced and why it matters. Implications for studies in comparative genomics of humans and chimpanzees. Chimpanzee Comparison chimpanzee of the transcribed genomic monkey basis to the human genome nearly identical human DNA similarity and now evaluating the last and now 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 the last you're under arrest, Nimrod. And that number has ranged depending on what test he's running and when he's running the test. But typically speaking, if we're looking at all of his statistics, it's around 80 to 89%, which is significantly lower than the secular numbers. So I did a very long-winded video going over each of those papers, revealing some tests that I've run myself, and basically explaining why Jeffrey Tompkins is incompetent at best and deceitful at worst. In my opinion, I should say. Now, after that video came out, a bunch of young Earth creationists, ranging from amateur and layman to professional, kind of came out and pushed back on my results and my statements in some pretty surprising ways, to be honest. Most prolific of which was Dr. Rob Carter, a marine biologist who works for the Institute for Creation Research. Like, he's a non-Answers in Genesis guy is mostly what you need to know. And um, while his first video didn't really go over any of my real claims or arguments, I made another video kind of making fun of him for that. She's trying to analyze his work in genetics and she's making some subtle mistakes of her own. Now, you know, I'm only human, so of course I make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. But my question is, like what? Which I'm not gonna go into, but it's clear that she's not a geneticist. That's right, baby. And then he released a series that's over two hours cumulatively, and it is a lot heftier. His series is basically two parts. He calls it an unintentional series. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But the first part is like less than 30 minutes and the second part is like an hour and a half. So it's around two hours long, which is actually something that I prefer because longer videos tend to have more cogent arguments and they tend to lay out their case in a lot more detail, which is what I prefer, especially when we're talking about arguments within science, in this case, genetics. And Rob has actually done a tremendous amount of work. He's done a lot of tests, which I appreciate because I had to do a lot of tests. And he pointed out something that I didn't expect. Rob Carter pointed out something that I got wrong in my video on Jeffrey Tompkins, a mistake that I made. It's not fair. It's not fair that like this is even something that I think anyone has to go through. Now, I'm sure you hear that and your first thought is what mistake and does this have bearing on the conclusions of Jeffrey Tompkins? We'll get there because we have a lot of content to get through and this story has more twists and turns than almost any video I've ever made. To call this a deep dive would be something of a disservice. I feel like I've dug to the core of the earth on this one. And so before we really get in and go through Rob Carter's entire series, I want to give you guys a little bit of background just in case you either are new here or you've forgotten really what's going on here. So the entire background is pretty in-depth and I don't just want to take like a 20 minute segment from my Tomkins video and put it in here. I'm going to take a much shorter segment. But before that I'm going to give you like the super condensed version again, like one more time. So Jeffrey Tompkins is a young earth creationist geneticist. He believes the earth is 6,000 years old roughly, and he thinks that the percent similarity between humans and chimps is a lot lower than secular science would have you believe. The reason he focuses on this number is because the high genomic similarity between humans and chimps is used to bolster the argument that we are in fact apes, or I guess I should say the fact that we are in fact apes, and that we evolve from other more basal apes. Jeffrey Tompkins can't have that. Again, young earth creationist and humans are specially created. So 
He decided from 2011 to 2018 to publish a series of papers, which are based off of some tests that he's run, again in the Young Earth Creationist Journal, the Answers Research Journal, and his argument is basically that humans and chimps are actually not as similar as secular science would have you believe. And the tool that he uses to make this argument is called BLAST. BLAST stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool and is used to find regions of similarity in genetic sequences. A sequence is just a string of base pairs, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine for DNA, which is what we're concerned with for today. These are abbreviated as A's, T's, C's, and G's. BLAST works in a pretty intuitive fashion, using a heuristic algorithm to match queries to a known database. So if I'm comparing a sequence in human chromosome 1, my query, to chimp chromosome 1, my database, BLAST will break my query into words. These words are smaller pieces of my query that serve to act as minimum matches before BLAST tries to align the full query to chimp chromosome 1 sequence. The whole database will be searched, and in the end BLAST will spit out a list of the closest comparisons ranked by similarity. By the nature of this comparison, extremely short sequences will return many more identical matches that are ultimately kind of uninformative. There are probably untold numbers of ATA strings in the human genome matching to the chimp genome, for instance. But longer sequences aren't exactly perfect either. If we have a sequence of 100 base pairs with an insertion at base pair 50, should BLAST say that these two sequences are 99% similar or 50% similar? That was a clip from my Tompkins video. So far, so good. At this point, I go on to explain how one might tackle allowing for or disallowing for gaps in a given search, and I say this. This is why BLAST has additional parameters that can allow it to ignore small differences and continue running comparisons if the operator desires. One such example is the gapped versus ungapped parameter, which not surprisingly controls whether gaps are allowed in the alignment. Gapped alignments can take insertions and deletions into account while ungapped alignments cannot, but are much faster for it. So at this point in the video, I pull up a paper by friend of the channel, Glenn Williamson, who argues that one of the reasons why Tompkins is wholly incorrect, and in fact the primary reason that his early work is wholly incorrect, is because he utilized that ungapped parameter. I show his paper on the screen, and then I give my own example of the same problem. Now, keep Glenn Williamson in your mind. Put a pin in him, because he's going to be really important later. The ungapped parameter determines whether to account for small indels in the comparison. Indel is a portmanteau of the words insertion and deletion, and it refers to insertion and deletion events that can occur in the genome. Insertions refers to when one or more base pairs end up inserted in a place where they weren't previously, and deletion is the opposite. One or more base pairs ends up deleted from where they should be. Suppose we have a nucleotide sequence of 13 base pairs. If the ungap parameter is used and there is a putative single nucleotide insertion in one of the sequences, then the BLAST algorithm cannot continue the alignment. Obviously, the first six nucleotides are identical in this example, but there seems to be an extra A in the query sequence which prevents the alignment from continuing any further. If the BLAST algorithm is unconstrained by the ungapped parameter, and we are using a gapped parameter, it is clever enough to insert a gap into the subject sequence, and that gap represents a putative insertion or deletion. So now we have the following alignment. The first example corresponds to the ungapped behavior and will report only six identical nucleotides in a query 13 nucleotides long for 46% similarity or identity. The second example allows for small insertions and deletions and will report that 12 out of the 13 nucleotides match, being 92% identical. I've subtly hidden in some clues to imply which portion of that clip was incorrect, and we will come back to it in greater depth later. So again, that was a clip from my previous video, and the real take home that I want you to kind of have for right now is the difference between gapped and ungapped, and later in the video we're going to get into some details as to the analyses that I ran, some of the pairs that I uh, compared against one another to contextualize Jeffrey Tompkins' numbers, but for the time being, what I want you to kind of appreciate is that my core point with gapped versus ungapped is that if you use ungapped, and Jeffrey Tompkins did, you are going to get erroneous results. And this applied to his 2011 to 2015 papers. He used ungapped as a parameter, and I used that parameter to essentially say, okay, all of those 
papers are bunk because of that parameter specifically. Then I moved on to some of his later work, his 2016 and his 2018, and I touched on a completely different problem that he has with those methodologies and also how strange it was that he seemed to just do a 180 on gapped versus ungapped after that 2015 paper. So here's a little bit from that same video, roughly three-ish minutes, where we go through Jeffrey Tompkins published data that again, he chose to put up on a GitHub account, the link of which is found in one of his uh, creation publications. So let's take a peek. If you scroll back up to that sort of materials and methods section here, you can click on the GitHub link and it's going to jump scare you with this picture of Jeffrey Tompkins that he uploaded to his GitHub account. You're going to click on chimp contigs here and it's going to take you to this little upload repository and you're going to want to click on all 18k chimp contigs on homo.csv. Now you're going to need to download this CSV. So you're going to click on it. It's going to take you to, you know, the raw data, and then you're going to save that link so that you can then open it uh, within Excel, which is what we're going to do. So here's my Excel file. It's going to look different from yours because what you're going to want to do is take all of Tompkins's data, put it into a table and give some headers that are going to match the data, his actual output. And you can find his output uh, again, back in his paper. So you have the sequence ID, that's the accession number, Q start, QN, the mismatch, the gap open, the P ident, percent identity, N ident, length, and Q len. So I've labeled those for you here, just so we know what we're all talking about. So we're all on the same page. And what I've done is I've sorted by query length. So we've got our smallest query lengths at the top and the biggest ones at the bottom, which, which you can see, or which you can see rather, if we scroll down to the bottom of our roughly 18,000 uh, sequences. So here we go, we end with 17,991, um, and that's our largest query length or QLEN. So let's find out how Tompkins got that 84%, but first allow me to tell you a little anecdote. I teach at a university, I teach biological anthropology lab, and what that means is that I have to deal with a lot of students. And what I've come to learn is that some students are better versed than others when it comes to understanding how math works. And what I mean by that is that sometimes students will come to me and they'll say, hey, I thought I had a much higher grade in my class than I actually have. And I'll say, well, how did you come up with this grade? And they'll walk me through it. And what they've done is they've taken all of the grades in their grade books, all their percentages for, dis for different grades, and they've averaged them to get a, a total percentage for their grade. Uh, but their mistake is they average tests that are like 100 points as being the same as just averaging the same with like five point attendance percentages. So five out of five, that's 100%. And they'll weight that the same as like a 60% out of 100 points for a test. And that of course erroneously leads them to, to come up with a grade that is higher than perhaps they thought because they aren't weighting the actual assessments. And this always disappoints me because I think to myself, you know, this is stuff I learned in middle school. I'm sure many of you learned how to weight things in middle school as well. And I always am concerned when I see 18 year olds and 19 year olds making this same mistake. So imagine my surprise when I come to find out that that is what Jeffrey Tompkins did. Looking at these numbers, again, our n ident, this is the number of identical base pairs in a length. So 203 identical base pairs out of a 208 length gives us a 97% similarity between the query and the database, between the chimpanzee and the human. Again, below it, we see 309 out of 444. That gives us a 69%. And if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we can see that we have out of our 18,000 or so contiguous sequences, we can see that we have um, 163,989 out of 167,095, which gives us a 98% similarity between those two sequences. So what Tompkins did is he just took the average of the percent identity column right here. Boom, there it is, 84.387%. He is weighing a 444 base pair sequence as identical to sequences that are over 150,000 base pairs long. He is making the mistake of a middle schooler. But here's the kicker with this. Um, let's do it the right way. So if we take the sum of our entire 
n ident, and then we take the sum of our entire length, and we divide the first by the second, we get 96%. When we weight them, we get conventional numbers. Tompkins, you goofball. So to sum it up, basically put it all into a single series of statements, my video from a few months ago, The Bogus Creationism of Jeffrey Tompkins, stated that the methodological problems with his work from 2011 to 2015 had to do with the ungapped parameter being utilized, which erroneously shortened matches and made them seem less similar than they actually were. Whereas his 2016 to 2018 methodology was problematic because he didn't weight the data. The problem with the former methodology, the earlier ungapped issues, I supported with my own series of tests, whereas the latter issues from 2016, 2018, and presumably onward, I utilized Jeff's own published CSVs to show that he's incorrect, something which I am going to credit again here, Glenn Williamson or Ruhit for, because he did it first. So the timeline for all of this is Tompkins does bogus science, then I make a video on it earlier this year, then I make a secondary video on it for fundraising for my uh, fieldwork in Kenya. <laughs> Then Carter responds, but doesn't say anything. I respond again, busting Carter for not saying anything. Carter releases his series, and finally, we land ourselves here with this video. So now we can finally, 20 minutes in, start covering Carter's response to me. And what I wanna really hone in on here are my mistakes, Tompkins' mistakes, Carter's mistakes, I want to talk about the truth of the data. How similar are humans and chimpanzees, and how does the percent similarity number change depending on the methodology used? I want to talk about how that bears in comparison to other organisms percent similarities and how all of that impacts young earth creationism and creationism generally. And then lastly, I want to talk about everyone's reactions to their respective mistakes. I'm going to organize this video in two parts to make it easier for your consumption. So let's begin with part one. Gutsy Gibbon and Robert Carter agree, Tomkin's wrong. <laughs> This is not sneaky framing. He just says outright multiple times that he agrees with me. But let's back up a minute because that punchline is actually a lot weightier than it might seem, believe it or not. And it is not the only punchline that I have for you in this very long, overly gratuitous video. But then that's what you've come to expect from me, no? What you're about to see is part two in an unintentional series on the differences between uh, the genetics of humans and chimpanzees. After I posted the first episode, I had at least three response videos made, uh, negative response videos, and an awful lot of negative comments. So Rob starts us off strong right off the bat by mentioning the tactical tripper release of me, Dan of Creation Myths, and Dapper Dinosaur. We all saw his previous video, the first part in this unintentional series, where he was like, Erica made all these mistakes, and I'm not going to talk about those here. And we were like, that's kind of ridiculous. And we all had different aspects of Rob Carter's video and general online persona that we kind of wanted to, to touch on. So we were all like, okay, instead of fighting over who gets to cover the video, let's just all cover it and release it at the same time. That would be funny. So those three videos were really kind of just three portions of a single response video. Um, and that's because not very many people pay attention to creationism online. So like three people who know each other and all looked at that video were like, we'll just all cover it and it will be quite funny. But Rob is like, this was far reaching. I received criticism from all portions of the internet. Mm, I think that's overselling it a bit. He also talks about the negative comments as if that's unprecedented on YouTube, and I hate to tell you this, Rob, but that's pretty par for the course. You can release the most benign video out there, and there will be people in your comments section who are telling you to do all sorts of horrible things to yourself. But I think it's funny that he calls this an unintentional series, because that tells me that he was not originally planning on going in-depth 
on my coverage of Jeffrey Tompkins. He kind of had to be forced to do so. And the thing that forced that was a bunch of people saying, hey, Rob, you should probably respond to this. And I do have to give Carter some credit here because it's difficult to get responses from creationists, even with that kind of pushback. A lot of the times they just kind of sweep the criticism under the rug. So, you know, good on Carter for coming back, circling back, if you will, and um, going a little more in depth. After this brief introduction, he talks about how most of this was filmed while he was on a lake, and I just think that's kind of funny and charming, genuinely. And we get his introduction for this first 20-minute episode. Hello. Welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm Dr. Rob. That strikes me as wholesome. I like it. I think it's cool that he filmed this on a water body. That does not sound fun or easy. Um, he introduces himself a little bit and then really starts to touch on the background for this video. Now, the reason I want to chill here, just to relax, is because the uh, the firestorm that erupted after I posted my last episode. Now, I knew that when I posted that, I was kicking a hornet's nest. I expected the results, and the results were basically what I expected. I mean, I was going to get a lot of hate mail, or I guess we call it hate comments now. I got more negative comments on that episode than anything I've ever done in my life. Dr. Carter, do you have any idea how lucky you are? Like, I get it, getting mean comments isn't fun, and I know it's not the suffering Olympics, but I'm a bigger YouTuber online these days, and I'm a woman that talks about science and dunks on people sometimes, and because of that, the types of comments that I get go beyond just mean comments with swears in them. Like, sure, I get the same comments you do, Rob, calling me a fraud or saying I'm an idiot or a liar or that my degrees are fake. I get those by the dozen per video per week. But I also get the added benefit of having my appearance consistently made fun of. People joke about how bad my voice is and how grating and irritating it is. Uh, and then there are the very fun and not at all scary threats of physical or sexual violence. Which, by the way, is why it's so unsettling when people who aim to speak out against me as a creator, no matter how small they might be, dox me, releasing my first and last name to the public. I'm glad it's fixed, you guys, but it shouldn't have happened in the first place. Now I looked at the comments on that video that you're talking about, there's like 800 odd comments there, and some of them are rude and mean or have, you know, curse words in them and are like calling you a liar and stuff like that. Uh, and I know that doesn't feel good, but what I'm basically saying here is you might want to get a thicker skin because those comments are not going to go away. And if you grow as a creator on YouTube, they're going to get meaner. Definitely the most controversial thing I've ever done in my life. And I knew it was going to happen before I posted it. So what this is going to be, this is going to be a little bit of a conversation to my supporters and my friends on how stuff like this works and a little bit of conversation with the, um, the other side. But um, if Erica or uh, Dan or um, any uh, one of the people associated with you watching this is not really for you, but I'm going to mention a couple things ab about you uh, later on. I believe that it started out this way, Rob, that you didn't mean for this to be directed at like me specifically or like Dapper or Dan of Creation Myths specifically, but mostly me. However, my name comes up dozens of times in these videos, so forgive me for taking this as if it's directed more or less at me. But here we are um, talking about uh, chimpanzee versus human differences. I mean, how different are our genomes? In my last episode, I started with uh, a video. I based it off a video that Erica, go, who goes by the name of Gutsick Gibbon, posted, uh, pretty much savaging uh, the mathematics and reputation of Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins. Savaging the career and reputation of Jeffrey Tompkins. Wow, Dr. Rob, you sure do make me sound menacing. You know what? I am not as mean as I would like to be. And I really wish people appreciated that more. I'm gonna warn you guys, all of this starts to get pretty LARPy after a certain period of time. I'm prepared for it because I do tabletop role-playing games, but sometimes the way they describe me or talk about me makes me feel like some kind of detestable primate sorceress that's plotting the demise of young earth creationism from the seat of my throne in a high up gothic castle above the clouds. I'm a graduate student with too much time on my hands, Rob. 
Well, that's actually not true. I don't have very much time at all at any given moment. I'm a graduate student with a feckless disregard for the time that I do have, Rob. And I didn't defend him. She noticed, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did not defend him necessarily. Well, basically what I said is, all right, you, you guys can argue about this all you want, but this is my position. And that's one of the things I got jumped on about. I didn't address the actual issue. And I knew that any weakness in my argument was gonna be twisted around and spit back in my face. I know that any mistakes I made, oh my, I would not get any mercy uh, from the other side. Yes, Dr. Carter, you made a fatal mistake when you exposed the chink in your armor, a weak spot exploitable for me to attack with my scimitar-like gibbon canines. I mean, do you see how LARPy this sounds? It's difficult to refrain, to hold myself back from monologuing or something. But I also expected to be gang tackled. I expected some groupthink. I expected an echo chamber. And sure enough, I, the, the comments that I got, the negative comments, they came in waves. Like one day people were saying this, and next day or day after that, they'd be saying something else. These accusations came in groups. I thought that was kind of funny. I'm not really sure what Rob expected here, like if the idea was that every individual person needed to run their own series of tests so that they could have like a justifiable reason to point out that Rob just completely skipped over talking about anything I got wrong and opted to kind of talk about other things. Now one of the main ones was that, um, oh after, okay, after saying that I'm not a real scientist or questioning where I got my doctorate or blah blah, all those kind of things. The biggest one that I got was that I didn't actually watch the video that I was commenting on. Well, that of course is not true. There's a difference between not watching a video and not agreeing with the video. So that's true, Rob, but the reason everybody thought that you didn't watch it is because you said there were things wrong in it, but wouldn't deign to talk about them. That's kind of weird. Now, if you watch my original video, you'll see that one of the reasons why I decided to test Jeffrey Tompkins' methods in the first place was because I was curious as to the percent similarities between different organisms that you would get using his methods if they were applied to, like, things that weren't a human and a chimp, because that was the only thing he was ever comparing. So there was never an additional pair of organisms to contextualize to ground the percent similarity that he proposed for humans and chimps. For instance, what if humans and chimps really were only 80% similar as proposed by Jeffrey Tompkins? Well, that doesn't mean anything unless you can look at some other organisms and put that into perspective, because as it turns out, other organisms that creationists would absolutely insist are in fact related, like lions and tigers, are less similar than humans and chimps by conventional means. So I was curious to see if that would hold out using Tomkins' methods as well. And it was during that set of experiments that I realized something much greater was amiss than a simple scaling problem. So we'll talk more about that later, but what Carter's talking about here is his response to a comment that basically asked, why is it that using Tomkins' methods, you get pairs of organisms that are evidently less similar than humans and chimps, and yet creationists are saying they're related? Point being, you can't use genetics if you're using Tomkins' methods to differentiate the created kinds. And like, again, that's what I was trying to test. That was part of what I was doing in my video. And in Carter's comments section, in response to that person, Carter said this. Um, but what I said was that I'm not aware of any creationist who's done uh, this comparison. I'm not aware of any evolutionist done this comparisons either. And then I put a caveat after that, but the caveat was ignored. And sure enough, since Erica has claimed to have done these comparisons I was commenting on, well, obviously I didn't watch the video or I would have known that she did it. Yes, this is fair. Except I can't know what was done. I can't reproduce the results. So this is really weird though, Dr. Carter. Why didn't you just say that part that you couldn't reproduce my results, therefore I probably didn't replicate Tompkins's correctly. Why didn't you say that in the response to that comment? And the reason I think, and I'm speculating here, is because you hadn't actually done any comparisons yet. I think that you saw my video, you were like, she probably didn't replicate them correctly, shot that comment off, and when the backlash got to be pretty intensive, you were like, okay, fine, I guess I'll go Head and try to replicate these results, or perhaps try to find something wrong with them. My additional support for that speculation is the fact that this became an unintentional series, as in you weren't planning on making these next two videos. I know that uh, Jeff 
had a very easy to find a GitHub where you could download his results and you could do all sorts of summaries and stuff like that. Um, I don't know that um, Erica provided that same information. Uh, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. No, you're right here, Carter. I didn't have a GitHub or anything like that. No repository for my program or for my protocol or anything like that because this was a YouTube video. This was a spur of the moment piece that I decided to make and then it kind of led me down a rabbit hole where I had to learn a bunch of programs and I was kind of figuring it all out as I went along. I didn't think it would get very much attention to be perfectly honest I thought people would look at it and be like okay like this is another person who's saying Jeffrey Tompkins is wrong um and just kind of going way more in depth with it like I was just repeating things that mostly people had already said although I did do some of my own stuff as well I didn't think it was going to be such a big deal otherwise I would have had everything up front right away. I certainly didn't expect you to respond to it, Dr. Carter. Now I included all the steps and parameters and things like that in the video, like that was part of the benefit of doing it in a video format is I could go step by step through what I was doing, the steps that I was taking, etc., the genomes I was picking, what have you. But part of the reason I think why I didn't take it as seriously as I should have is because this was kind of thankless work. Like, there's no way I would have been able to publish this anywhere. Who would accept it? Certainly not the creationist journals, we know that from experience, but I'm also not a geneticist, so why would I publish it in a genetics journal? Who would even look twice at my manuscript given my background and given the subject matter? And so I thought it would be good enough to simply film myself going through the steps, explaining my reasoning for each portion of my procedure and uploading it on YouTube, since this is my my hobby anyways. As a scientist, I'm not a geneticist. I do comparative morphology in Miocene apes, studying sexual dimorphism. That's my specialty. So on one hand, Carter is right here. I should have had a GitHub that had all of my materials available for those who wanted to replicate it. I think that would have made things a lot easier for Carter. Anyways, I try not to make the same mistake twice, so here's that GitHub link, Dr. Carter, and anyone else who wants to use it. And here's a quick note from the creator of said link, my husband. Hi, I'm Luke, aka Mr. Gibbon. I'm a professional software developer, and I helped Erica put together the Blast tool. You can find it on GitHub at this link. <laughs> yeah, so we, we put together the tool pretty quickly. Um, it's just kind of thrown together, so if any of that is bad, that's, uh, that's not my problem. Um, I don't know anything about genetics, so probably about the same level as everyone else involved. There may be some bugs in there, there might be problems. Uh, I don't think there are that many at least, hopefully. Uh, but it should be pretty good either way, so check it out. Um, if you do find any bugs, please report them. Um, you can open an issue on GitHub. Or if you have any problems installing or anything like that, please uh, let us know and we'll try to update the instructions. It should all be in the readme though. So check it out, link in the description, and let's get back to that comment by Dr. Carter. I think that comment was a defensive and instinctual pop-off defense of Jeffrey Tompkins, because clearly Carter had the tools he needed to replicate or approximately replicate my work. He didn't need the GitHub link to do it, and I think he kind of just wants to save face here and pretend like that comment had any validity when in reality, I don't think that he had actually watched the video, or at least he hadn't paid very much attention to it at the time of penning it. So I can't validate the results yet. Right, so at this point, I believe that he couldn't validate the results, but when that comment was penned, like weeks earlier, I don't think he'd actually done any comparisons yet, and so I think he was just kind of blowing smoke, if you will. But then he says something interesting. Now, Eric, I want to tell you something. Uh, kudos to you. Good job. Excellent work. You did a hard thing. Hey, yo, what the f <laughs> So I can't tell if this is a real compliment or not. I can't tell if he's being nice here and genuinely trying to, like, say I did some girl bossery or something. Because, like, he says more complimentary things to me in the remainder of this video and also in the next video. But at the same time, he does have this... <laughs> <laughs> this little um, 
text pop up in the next part. If you're listening, you should pause and check this out because it's very funny. In learning some new skills, and you brought in some experts and some uh, people who can help you, computer programming and whatnot. Yeah, Carter, we'll, we'll see about that. We'll talk about the program a little bit later. And you did a bang up job on a very difficult subject. So assuming that Carter is being genuine here, I want to say thank you, Dr. Carter. I very much appreciate this recognition because as I know you've experienced by now, BLAST is kind of a beast to deal with, whether you're talking about picking the right or appropriate parameters or simply running the dang thing and finding enough space to do the tests that you want to run or enough RAM or enough memory. The whole thing is kind of a slog, to be honest. And I also want to thank you for what you say next. And I agree with you on some of the most important parts, but there's a couple of things that I'm going to say in a little bit. Um, so Dr. Carter, I hope you will forgive me for this because I'm going to take a moment and gloat, not at you, but at many of the other young earth creationists who have been pestering me via email or in my comment section. Rob Carter and I agree that Jeffrey Tompkins' methods, whether we're talking about 2011, 2015, or 2018, are inappropriate. His methods do not work, and thus his results are erroneous. I think that Carter and I are on the same page with that because he says so here and also elsewhere in this series. Now, to pull a page from you here, Dr. Carter, we need to stop for a minute because that is all she wrote with regards to is Jeffrey Tompkins correct? The answer to that question is no. His methods don't work. None of them do. This does not change the fact that I made mistakes in my analysis of Tomkins's work, and we're going to get into those in a minute. It also doesn't change the fact that I should have uploaded a GitHub link, or that Dr. Rob Carter does some things that aren't exactly above board in my opinion. But the conclusion of the entire Jeffrey Tomkins saga with regard to are his methods appropriate or correct in any shape, form, or fashion, the answer is no. They are not. And I will note here that I do find it extremely alarming that it took me, someone who was a non-geneticist, tinkering around with Blast and making a YouTube video on it that happened to be pretty dang popular, for any of the creationists, other than Todd Wood basically, to like, talk about that. I don't think that, first of all, Blast is a appropriate tool to be using, and second of all, I don't think that Waiting samples is appropriate for the data set. I'll get to that in a minute. I got a lot of things to explain. That second bit about the waiting is interesting because Carter's basically like, I agree, Tom Kitts' 2018 methodology, the way that he weights those sequences is incorrect, but what he's going to go on to say is that the way that I weighted them in that little CSV clip, and the way that Glenn weighted them is also incorrect. That we came to the right conclusion, but for the wrong reasons. And I think Carter's wrong on that, We'll get more into it later. I have no desire to get in a tit-for-tat YouTube battle with YouTubes going back and forth and back and forth. And honestly, I really don't want to engage with uh, the people involved. I just don't trust them. So I'm not going to lie and say that I don't like fighting on YouTube. I've made a secondary career out of fighting people on YouTube. So I, I love it. I think it's really enjoyable. I love exchanging ideas and debating and going toe to toe in a verbal altercation, if you will. I think it's really fun. I'm animated. I'm alive. My heart's big. It's got hot blood going through it fast. I like to fight too. I like to eat. Uh, but no, the feeling is mutual on engaging with you though, Carter. I don't exactly trust you either. I'm going to explain why I don't trust you later on. Um, so we'll get there when we get there. I know I keep saying that a lot, but there, like you said, there's a lot of ground to cover. And I have reasons to. In fact, the reason why I posted that article on creation.com, uh, Rob Carter was wrong about everything, or whatever the exact title is, with a question mark afterwards in response to that YouTube video, was because I don't think that YouTube is a great place for that kind of a discussion. I didn't want to get into the never-ending battle. So I'm not shying away from it, I'm just doing it on my own terms. For those of you behind on the lore of this channel, me and Dan of Creation Myths did a video debunking Rob Carter in, I think it was the Dismantled documentary, a clip from the Dismantled documentary. 
and we basically talked, it might have been Is Genesis history, I, guess, I actually can't remember at this point, but we were basically like, Rob Carter gets everything wrong, like in this clip. He gets it all wrong, and we explain why he gets it all wrong, and Rob really didn't like that, and so he made a, an article responding to it, and then Dan and I responded to the article, and Rob didn't respond to that. So that's fine, like the ball's in his court, he can respond on his own terms, however he wants to, or he doesn't have to at all. It is completely his prerogative. I will always respond though. I'm gonna note a few things here moving forward because I'm gonna skip over them in Rob's video because I don't think they're relevant to the topic, but I do want to touch on them because he made the effort to talk about them and I want to recognize that. So the first thing that he talks about at one point, and I don't remember where it is because I've already like sliced up his videos into parts that I think are important to cover, the clips. He talks about how he didn't delete my comment. There was a portion in my response video at some point where I was like, I commented and I couldn't find it. And he says he didn't delete it. I believe him. YouTube is weird sometimes and I find it annoying and I should not have implied that he might have deleted the comment. I was feeling sassy. I was feeling provocative. I shouldn't have done that. And he probably didn't delete it. So Good on you, Rob. He also apologizes for doxing Dapper Dino, which happened a couple of months ago, maybe even years ago at this point. So my mistake, very bad form on my part, and I apologize and I apologize profusely. So please forgive me. I was trying to do the right thing, but you know, not once it was pointed out, I said, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that, okay? And uh, he hadn't apologized yet. So I appreciate that he apologized for that as well. So with regard to me, remember this video is not about me and yet, my interlocutor, or have you say that, or my, my inquisitor, if you will, uh, Erica, she posted a follow-up video afterwards. And yeah, I understand that, but came a little bit before I was ready to, to publish this video. So it's out there also. I will also have a live link in the show notes. But I actually forgot to mention, I'm eating off-brand M&Ms. That's not what I forgot to mention, but that's why I'm talking weird right now. He got some flack from commenters saying that my video wasn't directly linked in his description. I don't mind. Like, Rob, you don't have to link any of my videos if you don't want to. I forget to do that kind of thing all the time. Um, it's not the kind of slip up that content creators should make, but you know, I'm not gonna throw a rock in a glass house. So you're, you're good on that. No, no harm, no foul. The first thing Carter tackles is how Jeff inappropriately weighted his sequences in that 2018 paper. So here's the setup. We've got a couple of people arguing over human chimpanzee similarities using genetic data. Now the genetic data comes from the work of Cronenberg et al. 2018. Now the really cool thing about Cronenberg et al. 2018 is that they created the chimpanzee genome from scratch without using the human genome as a reference. This is something that Tompkins complained about for many, many years before this paper came out. He was effectively arguing that the only reason that the human and the chimp genomes look so similar is because the chimp was assembled with reference to a human and is thus artificially humanized. So that's why these contigs were so important to settling this matter with Jeff in particular. We're using a non-humanized chimpanzee genome. Before the genome was actually fully assembled though, there were several contigs. When I say several, I, I mean 18,000 contigs. A contig is a contiguous sequence and the sequences were all of different lengths. Some were in the hundreds, some were in the tens of thousands. And the problem, if you will recall from that spreadsheet that we went over that Jeff published himself, is that instead of weighting the percent similarity by the length of the sequence, he actually just took a percent similarity average, regardless of whether or not it was 200 base pairs long or 12,000 base pairs long. And you can't do that, right, Rob? And then he used a program called BLAST and he compared these things to the, uh, the human genome and he got all these average sequence matches and he just took the average of that. The thing is, you can't quite do that. And now, it is true, and Erica is right. You have to normalize your data. You have to account for the sequence lengths. It's not that simple. So here's our first instance of Erica is right, but she's not right for the right reasons. And th again, this waiting portion, I actually vehemently disagree with Carter on, and I think I have good reason to. But let's hear what he has to say first. Why is Jeff actually wrong? I just got passion and bumped the thing. When you're looking at data and you want to take an average, you have to test to see if your data are normal. That is, do they follow a bell curve? But instead of being a normal distribution, the sequence lengths are shaped not like a bell, they're shaped like a ski slope. 
So obviously I've edited that down, but what Carter is saying is that because the data are not normally distributed, you simply can't take an average of them. That's not appropriate. They have a non-normal distribution and a heavy skew. Carter talks about this, but the reason for this is that you have some sequences that are really, really long and also really, really similar, and then you have a lot of really, really small, kind of dissimilar sequences. And so Carter says that you can run all of these guys through these contigs through BLAST, and you can get your percent identity. Remember, that's the column that Tom can simply averaged regardless of the length. So you had a bunch of really short dissimilar sequences that were just being brutally averaged with enormous, ridiculously similar sequences. Carter notes this and talks about how if you plot those guys, you're going to get a bimodal distribution. And then he says something very interesting. But in these data, when you look at the percent identity scores from Tompkins' blast work, there are two different peaks, one of them closer to 80% and one of them closer to 98%, and they're about equal size. So we have two different sequence classes here. So no one notices this, and I'm not sure why, but this is one of the things that really bugs me about a lot of uh, genetics work, a lot of people doing biostatistics and things like that. They'll run their data through these giant black boxes, these big pipelines of, of data stuff, and then they get an answer at the end. But very often they don't go and stop and look at the data themselves. So we need to talk for a minute about picking genomes and why it's important to what Carter just said, because I'm not 100% sure that he understands what's going on in that bimodal distribution. Now, when you're picking genomes, you can have the option to choose something that is not masked at all, something that is hard masked, or something that is soft masked. Now, masking is a type of genome assembly that basically will cover up or mute highly repetitive regions of the genome. There are chunks of the genome that are full of short repeated sequences. So like TAG, 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 et cetera, et cetera, for however long. And the problem that you run into with repeats like that is they're very difficult to align for reasons that I'm sure are very obvious. What happens when you have a ton of repeats in one genome and a ton of repeats in the other, but it's missing like one letter in one or the other genome, right? Like this becomes very difficult very quickly. For this reason, in a lot of genomic comparisons, people tend to use soft or fully masked genomes so that we don't have to deal with these short tandem repeats, which are biologically uninformative and also kind of a pain in the butt to deal with. Those short dissimilar sequences are not functional regions of the genome, they're repetitive elements. And I really wish I could take credit for this myself, but this is actually coming from a comment by Dr. Ian Korf, the guy who wrote the BLAST textbook, commenting on Rob Carter's video here. So you can go find this and give this a like if you want. And what he says here is, the reason for bimodal percent identities is because there are two different types of sequences being aligned, nearly identical human and chimp sequences and unrelated repetitive elements from different parts of the genome. Pretend for a moment that you accept evolution. If orthologous sequences are 98% identical between humans and chimps, how is it even possible to get something at 80% identical? There are a precious few regions undergoing accelerated evolution. In other words, even for an evolutionary biologist, it would be very difficult difficult to get anything lower than 98% when 98% is near the neutral rate. If you do a blast between human and chimp and see 80%, it's time to look at what's actually being aligned. The answer is repetitive elements, which would cause most scientists to go back to the drawing board. So here's Carter actually responding to it on that video, something he didn't do to my comment on that video, but it's fine. In point number two, he says, exactly agreeing with Dr. Korf, the repetitive sequences were creating spurious results. This should have been noted in the original study. Yeah, the one by Tompkins. I, I agree, Dr. Carter. Sadly, it wasn't. Yes, that is very sad. However, there will be areas of significant dissimilarity between human and chimp. The question is how many, how long, and how dissimilar. Yes, I agree. How many, how long, and how dissimilar. If only someone had already done that kind of test. Carter talks about how he's fallen into some of these same traps when he's doing his conventional work and how you have to double and triple and quadruple check things. Sure, everybody makes mistakes. That's fine. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about how the genome is non-random. And he says this. So therefore, when you find a sequence in a biological sequence, you can very often find that same sequence in another species, uh, even, even distantly related species. 
because nothing's random. Or, or the pattern might be due to common ancestry. Or the pattern might be due to common design. Either way, that's what it starts with. How do you tell the difference between common design and common ancestry, Dr. Rob? How does any creationist tell the difference between common design and common ancestry? What are the criteria for determining that? That's a big question that I ask creationists a lot, and I have never once gotten a meaningful answer. Now, he says this while he's explaining how BLAST works, but I've already told you how BLAST works, so I'm kind of skipping over that part. So Carter goes on to talk about how BLAST's x-drop function works, penalties, rewards, things like that, and he talks about how if you take the largest contiguous sequence that has the highest similarity, a large chunk of it actually doesn't end up getting aligned because of how BLAST's x-drop reward and penalty functions work. And then he says you actually need to break it up into a lot smaller pieces to get a more accurate reading, and then he goes, I did that, and it dropped about like 1.5, 1.6%. So even if you were to take that, that high value as the percent match, well, Obviously, the real match is less than that. How much less? I don't know. You would have to take that long sequence and break it up into lots of little pieces, blast each one of them independently, which, okay, so I, I did it. And uh, what you get is an average match. And this time, you don't have to weight your samples because all your sequences are the same length. The average match dropped by 1.6%. Now, maybe I'm not understanding this correctly, but if we're using context clues of what Carter said previously and we're talking about the same contigs, then what he's saying here is the longest match, which was like 98, 99% similar, became like 1.6-ish less similar. So we're talking like 96, 97% similar instead which is exactly in line with the conventional numbers for whole genome similarity, including indels. Thank you for this, Carter. Very much appreciate that. Okay. So what we call the BLAST book, this great little book with the coelacanth on the cover that all the scientists in genetics had, uh, has this wonderful diagram inside that explains extra. Wow, that is a really nice diagram. Who made that diagram? In fact, who wrote that book? Oh, cool, it's Ian Korf from the comments section earlier. We should remember his name, I think. It might come up again later. So Carter goes on to talk about some pretty big problems with using BLAST as an alignment tool. Some of them I talked about in my original video, the problems with using long versus short sequences, each having their pros and cons, and how the extra penalty and reward system that is innate to BLAST actually plays into this. And that's all fine and good. So honestly, I'm ready to toss BLAST entirely. Well, that's something you're going to have to talk to Jeff about, Dr. Carter. I didn't choose BLAST because I thought it was the best tool for the job. I was trying to replicate Jeffrey Tompkins' methods, and I wanted to contextualize his methodology, his parameters, with something that was a little bit more reasonable. It is an inappropriate tool. It does not work for comparing humans and chimpanzees. I would love it if it did. If we had sequences that were created de novo and were accurate and were about the same length, so you don't have to do any weighting, then you could possibly do this, but you probably have to separate it into coding region, non-coding region, repetitive DNA, you'd have to do some masking. So I'm not a geneticist, but a very brief look at Cronenberg 2018 seems to indicate to me that they did exactly what Rob Carter is asking for here. If we had sequences that were created de novo and were accurate and were about the same length, so you don't have to do any weighting, then you could possibly do this, but you probably have to separate it into coding region, non-coding region, repetitive DNA, you'd have to do some masking. I mean, thank you. I don't know if he's not read the paper or what. And more recent full-scale review papers on the genomic similarities and differences between humans and chimpanzees, such as that by Sunsova and Buzdin in 2020, revealed that 96% is about what we're still holding at for the entire genome. Which brings up all sorts of questions about similarity. I mean, what percent similarity are you talking about when you have to delete data or mask the data? And that's the issue. So this is why when I gave my response video, I pretty much just accepted at face value 
uh, Seaman and Bugs's work on their alignment program, and they said that the percent similarity of all the alignable areas is 96.6%. Right, but the non-alignable regions are not non-alignable because they are entirely different sequences. The majority of them are not alignable because they're composed, again, of those extremely repetitive sequences. That's our starting point. It's less than that. Because even in that area, after they got rid of all the things humans and chimps didn't share, there were still places that didn't align at all. And then when you factor in all the hundreds of thousands of indels, it's more places that don't align. And so in Erica's video, she said, yeah, she'd be happy with humans and chimps being about 95% similar. Okay, I'll take that. I'll, I'll have that as a starting point. I think it's less than that, though. Okay, Dr. Carter, forgive me here, but I think you're mixing a few things up, right? The similarity between humans and chimps for protein coding regions is around 99%. The percent similarity for the entire genomes, including those thousands of indels you just talked about, is 96%, give or take. But like that's including the indels. Now, if you want to talk about things like the, the repeats and the copy number variations and things like that, the percent similarity might go down, but it also depends on how you actually tally everything up, which is something that you say here. But it depends on if you're talking about total percent similarity, which is very hard to calculate, or percent similarity of only the shared regions. Yes, it's very difficult to calculate overall percent similarity because there's different ways to look at it. Let's look at a couple of examples using the Bible since, as Dapper Dinosaur pointed out, those seem to resonate with you. The King James Bible, for instance, has 783,137 words, while the New International Version has 727,969 words. This means the latter is only 92% the size of the former. But what if 1,000 of the words missing from the NIV are the word Lord? How would we consider these differences? After all, the NIV has the word Lord in it many times, ultimately just fewer times than what we find in the KJV. What if we had two copies of the KJV and then due to a printer error, one copy ended up with the entire book of Genesis printed three times at the beginning? Genesis alone composes about 4% of the Bible, which means technically the duplicated Bible has an extra 8% to it. However, the non-duplicated Bible can be found in its entirety within the duplicated Bible. The latter just has several more copies of Genesis in it. So the non-duplicated Bible is 100% identical to the duplicated Bible, but the duplicated Bible is only 92% similar to the unduplicated Bible. How do you actually count up these differences? Do you? The point of all this is that comparing genomes is hard. I believe you said this yourself, Dr. Carter. And it's important that when we're talking about percent similarities between any two given organisms, we qualify what we're saying. Are we talking about functional regions? Are we talking about the entire genome? How are we handling copy number variations? How are we handling repeats, etc.? So Carter gets a little philosophical at the end of this first video and says this. But I also want to know, maybe I shouldn't even ask the question, but I'm just kind of wanting to know why, um, why Erica and Dan and um, uh, uh, Glenn Williamson, that's, that's the name, I hope I got it right, with all their brilliance and all their, their, their smart brains and Glenn's obvious computing prowess, why they even care? I mean, if we're just stardust, if we're just accident accidental collections of molecules that came together for a little while and then are going to go away and depart and never be seen again, I mean, what gives? So I think he's kind of asking this question in two ways. The first part is kind of broad. It's like, why do you care how similar we are to chimpanzees in the first place if we're just stardust? And it's like, well, it's really interesting to know about our place in the tree of life on planet Earth and to know that we aren't apart from nature. We are apart of it. We are just as much a part of the same tree of life as a chimpanzee and a bonobo and a gorilla and orangutan and an isopod and a dog and a tree and a single cellular organism as everything else on the planet Earth is. I think that's beautiful. I think that that is wonderful. It fills me with awe to be a part of the universe like that. And I find discovery and curiosity to be one of the things that makes us human, one of the things that makes life enjoyable. But the secondary question, I think, is like, why do I care about debunking Jeffrey Tompkins? Because he's wrong and he's trying to spread that 
mistruth, whether it's intentional or otherwise, to as many people as possible. I think its prevalence as a creationist statistic speaks to that. And when we are wrong, we should be corrected. Don't you agree, Dr. Carter? Who cares what anyone else thinks? Especially considering that creation is not really a threat to evolution because we're a small community and, well, most people either ignore us or don't tell the truth about what we say and therefore we don't seem to have much of an effect on them. Well, so what? I mean, it's not like flat earthers that were taking over the internet a couple of years ago and causing all sorts of problems. Uh, creationism doesn't really have that big a deal in the halls of science. I'm no threat to anybody. So I agree that the number of creationists, and specifically young earth creationists, is shrinking in the West, and I do think that that's a good thing. But I think it is incredibly irresponsible and also very surprising for Rob Carter to say that young earth creationism is no threat to anyone, especially when he himself witnessed the backlash that comes with fostering an attitude of science denialism and mistrust when he and some of his fellow members of CMI posted about the benefits of vaccination. You don't get to spend decades telling people that science, big S science, is wrong on some of the most foundational concepts and ideas in biology. Hundreds of thousands of scientists misleading the public, either intentionally or otherwise, and, and act surprised when they apply that mistrust in science and that conspiratorial attitude to other avenues of biology, like vaccination. I think it's really funny that you mention flat earthers here, Dr. Carter, because your impact as a young earth creationist is directly analogous to theirs. You sow seeds of doubt in general accepted ideas within science, and then when people start to doubt the obvious, they start to doubt everything else attached to it, going from vaccines to climate change to the shape of the earth. In fact, don't you think it's a little bit strange that so many flat earthers are also young earth creationists. One of the reasons why I bust young earth creationism so hard and spend so much time deconstructing its ideas is because I think it's a gateway conspiracy that leads to significantly more harmful ones that are bad for society in general. Now, I'm not under the delusion that Rob Carter or any of the professional Young Earth creationists watch any of my content if it doesn't specifically refer to them, but if they did, they would find what many of my viewers find, which is that I am not hostile to science-affirming religion. That's why I bust Young Earth creationism specifically. For goodness sakes, my department is biological anthropology, the study of human evolution, and I would say the majority of my colleagues have some kind of religious affiliation. I am the last person who is going to say or imply that you can't be religious and do good science. I'm not going to make anyone lose their career. He's brought this up a couple times, making someone lose their career or trying to tear someone's career down. And like, I think that must be what he thinks I'm trying to do to Jeffrey Tompkins. I just want Tompkins to admit that he was wrong and retract his papers or at least put a notice on them that they're incorrect. That's all I want. I know that it's not my circus, but somebody's gotta step up and save those <laughs> monkeys. And today, it looks like that someone's gonna have to be me. So let's go to work. This video begins to wind down and you're relaxing. You're thinking, okay, we're almost through with this one. And uh, then Carter hits you with a jump scare. But there's a reason for me to care. And the reason I care, because Jesus red-pilled me. Each time when I come here, I am abused. I'm not sure Carter fully understands the modern connotation that that phrase has kind of evolved, but I did think it was very funny and I was drinking water and I like almost did a spit take when he said that. Carter spends the next little bit proselytizing and I would normally skip that portion because I don't think it's relevant, but he does say something at the end that I want to touch on because I think it speaks to Carter's motivations and there's something very tragic about it. One day, I woke up and I no longer believed what I used to believe. And my eyes are open to the, the spiritual battles that are happening around us. And the people that I don't believe there's a spiritual side of life at all, well, 
I think they're missing something. I see them think they're missing something very important. And if evolution in general is a reason for them to deny the spiritual side of life, well, then I'm going to try to address evolution. If belief in billions of years is the reason why they don't believe in the claims of Jesus, well, then I'm going to try to address the belief in billions of years. This makes me kind of sad. I think Carter has good intentions. I think he really does believe that you can't be a Christian and accept evolution and the ancient age of the earth. But the fact is, more Christians in the West, at least in the United States and Canada and UK, etc., more Christians in these locations accept evolution these days and the ancient age of the earth than don't. And the people who have left the faith, at least the ones that I interact with, often point to the rigid interpretation of scripture that is held by young earth creationists who say that the science that we understand to be true and their interpretation of the Bible cannot live side by side and that you must pick. They ended up choosing the reality that they understand over a specific interpretation of scripture and thus leave the faith entirely. With this in mind, it would seem that young earth creationism, not evolutionary theory in the ancient age of the earth, are driving people away from Christianity. And what that means is that Robert Carter, in his effort to keep people being Bible-believing Christians, is actually driving them away more than the adversary he has created. In a way, he has become that which he hates, and if that's not a Greek tragedy or the ending to an Earthbound-inspired indie game, I don't know what it is, but it certainly bums me out. But from the other side, who cares? Who cares one lick about anything? What, nothing matters at all, except, you know, we, we need a paycheck because we get hungry, but even hunger is just a mirage because, you know, we're really not anything and we're not reporting to the universe. The universe is just gonna eat us alive one day because it's just dust. I don't know that I inject a lot of my personal opinion into my videos with regard to bigger thinking, but life is beautiful in part because it is brief. It is such a privilege, such a pleasure to be here at all. From the small pleasures of existence, like a meal when I'm hungry, warmth when I'm cold, or the embrace of a loved one, to the ecstasy of learning and knowledge, the wonder of art, or the connection innate to being human. There is tragedy and despair, and there is elation and triumph and everything in between. Maybe there is more, and maybe there's not, but to me, from here, it's all gravy. I am not uh, hiding anything that I'm aware of. I am not scurrying, scurrying around trying to pretend I'm someone I'm not. I'm a fallible, sometimes angry, sometimes depressed, sometimes very confused individual. And yet, I'm also a follower of Jesus and he's more important to me than anything else. Please someone tell Rob that he can have all of that, all of it, and accept evolutionary theory and the ancient age of the earth. Someone reach out to him. Okay, so we are an hour in, about an hour and eight minutes, I think, at present look, but that might change. And we have successfully summarized the issues thus far, including the history of this particular exchange, and we've covered Carter's first video. But now we have to get into the second, much longer video. I mean, you, you knew you clicked on a Gutsy Gibbon video, right? Like, these are always long-winded. Hey, welcome to Biblical Genetics. I'm Dr. Rob. Welcome to part three of my unintentional series on human and chimpanzee genomic differences. Woohoo! Thank you, Rob. I feel very welcomed. I'm sure this is as fun for you as it is for me. Uh, this, for me, honestly, is not fun. Okay. First of all, the amount of work was phenomenal. I've been working on this morning, noon, and night, uh, all my days off while traveling, while sitting in airports, while sitting in planes, while waiting in lines. I've been working on this. My computer has been running uh, all night long, multiple nights in a row while I've been sleeping. I'm just crunching numbers, crunching numbers, trying to get a handle on a very difficult subject. Oh, wow, Rob, what do you know? Same experience. You can actually, well, I don't know, maybe I can show you guys uh, just out of frame here. If I move like that, 
there's my computer, my other computer. It's been running for over a month now on several different analyses. So um, I sympathize. But actually, I kind of like that work. So that's not the not fun part. I actually think that that's kind of fun too. It's fun to see the results come out. And it's also fun to compose the response videos. The not fun part is watching all the response videos that um, are basically saying that I'm a kook, I'm lying, that I'm dumb, um, that I don't know what I'm talking about, things like that. I think my response videos are free from most of that, although I, I think I do imply quite a bit that you don't know what you're talking about, about some stuff, but you do that to me too, so I think we're even. Uh, but also, because there's two different people involved here. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins at the Institute for Creation Research has done most of the work on human and chimpanzee differences from the creationist perspective. And then Gutsack Gibbon has done most of the work critiquing him from an evolutionary perspective. And um, I don't believe either of them. I think they're both making mistakes. Um, so I think that's a little bit of incomplete framing though, Dr. Carter, because you're missing one of the key players of this game, which is the entire conventional science community, which says that humans and chimpanzees are 96% roughly similar looking at the entire genome. That's who Jeff is grappling with. So there's three players in the game then, aren't there? Really four. There is the conventional scientific community. There is Jeffrey Tonkins, a singular creationist who is critiquing them. There is a PhD student who is critiquing Jeffrey Tompkins. And then there's you, who is mostly critiquing me, but also slightly critiquing Jeff. And player one does not know that players two through four exist. So that's, that's scary because usually when you get into a field and you're reviewing the people that are arguing, you usually say, okay, this person's right and this person's wrong. When you say both people are wrong, well, it's possible that you're actually introducing a third incorrect opinion. So we haven't even gotten to part two yet, but let me remind you that I did get something wrong, but Carter still agreed with my conclusion that Jeff is incorrect. So really what Robert Carter is saying here is that one person is wrong, that's Jeff. The second person is wrong in their reasoning for why the first person is wrong, that's me. But the conclusion that Jeff is wrong is still correct. And then there's Rob Carter introducing this third opinion. I think that's critical because he spends most of this video talking about me and my mistakes and not about Tompkins and Tompkins' mistakes, despite the fact that Carter and I agree that Tompkins is wrong he just doesn't agree with my reasoning as to why Tompkins is wrong. In fact, he just point blank says this. Because I don't think we're going to end up with Tompkins' 85% similarity value. It's going to be higher than that, but it's not going to be for the reasons why some of the evolutionists are saying. Carter gives an amusing anecdote about what it's like to run tests in BLAST that I actually relate quite a bit to. Because all I do is sit here and pound keys and think and pull my hair out and say, ah, oh, oh, now I got a revelation, I got a giant exclamation point that pops above my head, haha, and I laugh and cackle as I type more keys in, which I was doing this afternoon a little bit because I thought I had learned this one little thing that would answer everything and turned out it actually was a big nothing burger again. And then he gives us a fairly large promise. And I think I figured out what's going on. I think I know why Tompkins and Gutsuck Gibbon are getting very different results, at least mostly. Now, before we foray into our next part here, I want to get something straight. Carter does not actually know why Tompkins and I are getting drastically different numbers. He thinks he knows, but he's actually not correct on that, and I'm going to prove it a little bit later. In this part, he points out something that I do not explain adequately, and to me, that's a mistake because truthfully, it's something I didn't know. It's a mistake that I made. It was a lapse in my understanding. And we'll get to that too. But this promise that he makes, that he's figured out the reason why Tompkins and I have uh, numbers that are discrepant in nature is not correct. It's all quite strange because I want to remind you again, me and Carter agree, Tompkins is wrong. His methodology is wrong no matter which year, no matter which paper you're actually looking at. But... That does not stop me from saying it's time for part two. Rob Carter destroys Gutsick Gibbon. Uh, there's a verse that, uh, that has been in my mind a lot over the last month or so. It's James 3.1. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, and I'll add, 
sisters. We stand an inclusive king, Dr. Carter. Thank you. Even though this was kind of a, a dig, I think. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for we all stumble in many ways. So let's take this down a notch. Let's get rid of the personality, get rid of the angst in it and the frustrations. Speak for yourself, Dr. Carter. Angst is the spice of life. I'm kidding. Well, kind of. I am going to be meticulous here in my response to Robert Carter's genetics foray, his deep dive, uh, but I'm going to do it with style and fun and jokes because that's what I do on Guts and Gibbon. Now, this one is going to be a good, long, deep dive into genetics. In preparation for this, I have reviewed a lot of videos, including one by Ruhif, Creationist Peer Review is Utter Utter Poo. He published that in 2018. And of course, 80% Chimpanzee, The Bogus Creationism of Jeffrey Tompkins, which Gutsuck Gibbon produced in May of 2023. And then Tompkins responded to me, kind of, which was produced in July of 2023. That one video was three hours long, which is fine. I watched it. It was, it was interesting. And then I did my response video and Gutsuck Gibbon replied, professional creationist, that's me, responds to my Tompkins debunk, kind of. That was in August of 2023. I included that bit because I actually thought it was a really nice summary of the story so far, except he left off the beginning stuff of Tompkins' like, papers and stuff like that. But I provided that at the beginning of this video. So now you have the full picture for like the eighth time. And, um, well, that one's really funny because she, in the thumbnail, she put a, a speech bubble and all I'm saying here is Erica, mean. Uh, I, I, I'm laughing at that because, yeah, I flagged her as being a little aggressive here. I like this because my audience members know that in the Young Earth creationism debunking community, I have a reputation for being the most pugnacious, antagonistic, belligerent, and furious interlocutor. I can be aggroed from across the map. I don't assume good faith. I am not patient. I am the type to come in hot every time and tear you down with a, just a reckless disregard for who you are as a person. <laughs> That's what I'm known for, the mean one. That's me. But also, I've got a reputation in our office for being naive when it comes to the intentions of other people. I've gotten myself in hot water multiple times when I took someone at their word because I thought they were a nice person and I didn't realize they're actually being duplicitous and I've gotten burned several times. And so here is um, that, that the phrase, Erica, mean, which is the opposite of people that usually trip me up are the nicer people. I can, I can flag a person who's being aggressive and being overly confident and, well, I put her in that category. Now, is she right or not? We're going to see. Uh, yeah, she's made some critical mistakes. I'm taking this entire section as a compliment because to me, Carter is saying that I'm like the good kind of villain. I'm the right kind of bad guy. What you see is what you get with Gutsy Gibbon. I'm aggressive, but I'm not a twist villain. I like that ending too. Is she right? Well, we'll see. She's made some critical mistakes. The translation for that is exactly what Carter said earlier. She is right that Tompkins is wrong, uh, but for the wrong reasons. It is true, and Erica is right. But I am aware of the title of this part, and I am going to stick to it. So in the first video on this topic, I said, oh, Erica's making subtle mistakes of her own. What I was referring to was a, a nothing of a comment that she had said that the letter N in a genome represents an indel. It, it doesn't. It's actually a sequencing gap. Indels only apply when you're comparing sequences and you have to add spaces to get them to line up, which is going to be a big part of this conversation. Now, he doesn't timestamp this, so I'm not sure where I said it. It had to have been in the first video, I think, but the only time I ever really discussed ends was when it was to do with masking, because ends are the letter that is used for masking repeats. This is something that was confirmed again by Dr. Korf in the comments section. Carter talks about some cool skills that he's learned and how he's managed to like draw some cool maps of genomes and specifically he's comparing how complete the first version of the chimp genome was versus the second versus the third. And I actually think that his drawings are really helpful and I might use them myself in later videos because it just shows you how complete the chimpanzee genome really is. He does the same with the human genome and at the time that Jeff was running his experiments and then later that I was running mine, the full telomere to telomere human genome sequence where it was 100% completed and done was not available. 
Now it is, and I've used it in some new experiments. But the reason I'm saying this is because Carter used the most complete version of the chimpanzee genome, as well as the most complete version of the human genome. So we get to the first criticism that Carter has of my replication of Jeffrey Tompkins' work. And the first issue that he has is that the genomes that I used as downloaded from Ensemble were top level sequences. They were top level assemblies, I guess I should say, which means they don't include accessory sequences or chunks of the DNA that haven't been placed, they haven't found their spot in the DNA full genomic assembly just yet. You can think of a completed genome, like the full telomere to telomere human assembly as a completed puzzle, where every single puzzle piece has found its place and you can see the entire picture full stop. Most genome assemblies have pieces missing and those extra pieces are off to the side. They haven't yet found their place in the jigsaw puzzle as it currently exists. Those are your accessory sequences. So you can choose to compare those accessory sequences as well. But for my study, which was abbreviated anyways, there wasn't really a point. And I'll touch more on that in a moment. Tompkins. He's not just using the chromosomes. When you have a genome file, there are accessory sequences often associated with it. Those are sequences that have not yet been added to the chromosomes themselves. They haven't been assembled, but we know they belong somewhere in that genome. So he's, he's not using what's called the top level genomes. Uh, Gutsa Gibbon in her work, in fact, in one of the videos where she showed what she did, it's clear that she's using the top level genomes only. She's skipping over the accessory sequences that belong there that aren't there yet. Yes, Dr. Carter, and I'm also skipping over most of the genome. My study was abbreviated. I took 300 base pair slices and I sampled like a thousand of those uh, across each given chromosome for a total of 300,000 base pair coverage per chromosome. So no, I'm not getting a full picture of the genomic comparison. But the point wasn't to do a full genomic comparison. The point was to investigate how Jeffrey Tompkins' methods treated other pairs of organisms that were ridiculously similar. So for example, even though I was only doing abbreviated samples of each chromosome, those percent similarities reflect the conventional numbers. So if you have a smaller abbreviated study that is reflecting the conventional numbers, how does Tompkins treat that same data set? The point being that if two organisms are ridiculously similar by conventional means and not as similar by Tompkins' means, will that reflect regardless of the pair of organisms? As in, will lions and tigers show out to be less similar to one another than humans and chimpanzees, regardless of whether using conventional or Tompkins' methods, does it scale or not? In fact, just to really refresh everybody's memory, Brian, here is the clip or series of clips from that video where I make this a part of the thesis statement for the entire point within the video, something that would have been emphasized more if Tompkins' methods hadn't been so screwy. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, what exactly is the point, hmm? I mean, let's say for a moment Tompkins is right. Let's say that humans and chimpanzees are only 89% similar genomically, or they are only 84% or 80% or 70%. Let's say that that is the number. What does it mean? Because without reference to other species, to other species comparison, this number means absolutely nothing. What if Tompkins were to use his methods and compare rats and mice, for example? Now, Tompkins is a young Earth creationist. He's collaborated with ICR and Answers in Genesis and CMI, all of these big young Earth creationist organizations. And for those of you who don't know, young Earth creationists and creationists in general, but typically the young Earthers, tend to believe that in the beginning, when God created all of the animals on the planet, he created them according to their kind, and that they are allowed to diversify diversify and change a little bit, just not too much. So for example, there's a cat kind and all cats are related to one another and can change within that group. And all dogs are related to one another and can change within that group. But they would of course not accept that humans and chimpanzees are a part of the same kind or a part of the same group. So 
What about something like rats and mice? What if Tompkins' methods showed that rats and mice are less similar, genomically speaking, than humans and chimps? Because Answers in Genesis lists rats and mice as a part of the same kind on their giant Noah's Ark boat replica in the middle of Kentucky, and I would suspect that Tompkins would agree that rats and mice are a part of the same created kind. So what would happen? If rats and mice are less similar than humans and chimps, his argument that his reduced number for human chimp similarity negates common ancestry between the two organisms falls apart, doesn't it? And seriously, isn't it so strange that he doesn't ever compare anything else? I mean, he's been obsessed with this particular number for decades, but he's only ever compared one human and one chimp. He's not even comparing chimps to chimps or humans to humans, just human versus chimp. And that's it. Nothing else for reference. And you know, isn't that strange? Isn't that suspicious? So I thought, uh, why not compare more species? Why not just compare as many as we can and see how Tomkins' methods hash out with those things that Creatius would consider to be related organisms. Now, like, I'm here telling you running an ungapped analysis is entirely inappropriate, completely unworthy of time, uh, and really just a broken way of running a comparison. But let's jump into a fantasy realm of gingerbread men and unicorns and trickle-down economics for a moment, and let's just accept Tomkins' methods. And, you know, do what he wasn't brave enough to do. Let's expand the analysis. So one more time for the uninitiated, there is a reason as to why this is relevant for creationists. They, and specifically young earthers, believe the earth was created by God some 6,000 years ago and that Noah's flood was a legitimate worldwide event that is responsible for the entirety of the geologic column. Answers in Genesis and the Institute for Creation Research, thus Tompkins, believe that all modern animals descend from the archetypal species that Noah took with him on that big boat. Creationists call these groups kinds, and it roughly translates to the family level in modern taxonomic terms. So Felidae, the cat kind, has a progenitor cat pair on the ark that then diversified into all felids we have today, as well as all fossil felids in between now and the start of the Cenozoic in just 4,400 years. If that sounds like evolution, but just on fast forward, that's because it is, and they just don't like to call it that. Functionally, there is no difference. Of course, this creates a problem, right? Modern lions and modern house cats are about 95% similar, and young earth creationists consider them to be the same kind. Yet this is below 98.8%, isn't it? Despite using the exact same methods that give us the human-chimp similarity. This is why Tompkins needs the number to be lower, and I, as well as others, suspect it's also why we don't get any other comparisons. So 300,000 base pairs isn't that many, considering genomes are billions of base base pairs long, but the point was to sample randomly from each chromosome, see how similar conventional methods would consider the, the comparison to be, the two organisms to be, and then see how Jeffrey Tompkins' parameters would treat the same set of organisms. So Rob, accessory sequences are not important for this particular study, and they would only be important if I was effectively trying to get a genuine bona fide percent similarity for the entire genome of two different organisms, including the parts that hadn't been put into the assembly yet, which is not what I was doing. But this is what we're talking about. We're talking about comparing genomes and genome quality and completeness of the genomes and what which version of the genome are you going to use? The entire thing with all the accessory or just the chromosomes? Now, in that first video, I tried to move the argument. I didn't, I tried to not throw Jeffrey Tompkins under the bus. I tried to get away from uh, Gutsa Gibbons' arguments and say, okay, but here's my position. My position is we don't start down here at 85%. Let's start at the 96.6% similarity level that was produced by uh, Richard Bugs, in fact, uh, Semen and Bugs 2020. That's their calculation. I said, that's a good starting point. Well, that didn't go over too well because everybody noticed that I didn't address the, the obvious questions that were presented. So the obvious question that was presented in the form of my video, the entire point of the entire thing was, 
Are Jeffrey Tompkins' methods appropriate? Do they actually work? Are his results legitimate? And secondarily, if they are, or even if they're not, how would his methodology treat other pairs of organisms? And does his work actually help young earth creationism in that context? Or does it just change the scale? None of it ended up mattering because his methods are just insane. This video here, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it in detail after thousands and thousands and thousands of analyses that my computer has done. Okay, excellent. Obviously, I've already seen the video multiple times, but I'm ready to get to the part where I can eat some crow so we can move on to some new punchlines. Dr. Carter talks about a video that Dapper Dinosaur made, actually the one from the triple release, and he has this to say. Repeating some of the mistakes that Erica made, which I'm going to address, it's okay. Everyone's gonna make mistakes here, myself included, but just, just follow me here. And then he talks a little bit about Dan from Creationist who made the third video in that triple release. And he says this. This is a Dan of Creation Myths uh, saying, I'm disappointed in Dr. Rob Carter. Well, hey Dan, thank you for thinking so highly of me that, um, that you were disappointed in my response. Um, I think after this level, I might go back up in your esteem uh, because I'm going to destroy everybody in the process. And I don't know, I kind of think that you're going to like that process. You don't fool me, Robert Carter. I see right through you. I know that you like making these response videos, and I know that you like getting a little sassy in them. I see the glint in your eye. You're having fun. And the reason you're having fun is because you feel that you're in the right. You're standing in a confident position. And these kinds of videos are very fun to make when you feel like you've got it. You're more like me than you think, Robert Carter. You and I, your gentle and modern adversary, share more than you currently appreciate, but we'll go over some of your mistakes here in a moment. Ho ho, Rob Carter, you caught me monologuing in a LARPy way. Like I said, you, you guys make me a D&D &D villain. Carter goes on to say that the types of media we're going to be looking at is extensive for his analysis. We're going to be looking at Jeffrey Tompkins' work from 2011 to 2018. We're going to be looking at semen and bugs from 2020. We're going to be looking at my videos. We're going to be looking at some other conventional works, potentially, as well as videos by Dapper Dinosaur and Dan of Creation Myths. And Creation Myth, hey, Creation Myth, you're going to be unscathed in one of my analyses because you didn't mention it. I don't know if you wanted to or not, but you didn't, so you're going to escape that one. I'm sure you're not worried about it, but hey, just way to go, man. Now, while Carter makes it pretty clear that he's going to be coming after yours truly and analyzing my work for a lot of the video, he does have this to say about Jeffrey Tompkins. Um, concerning Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, the geneticist, he is trying to come to grips with how similar humans and chimpanzees are. And for well over a decade, he's coming out with numbers that are very different than the numbers coming out of the evolutionary community. Generally say humans and chimpanzees are 99% identical, 98% identical. Some people say 96, some people might even say 95. Um, but it's, it's a high number. Tompkins is getting estimates below 90%. 85% is like the average of most of his, his work. You can never have too many recaps, in my opinion, and since I'm well-versed in beating this particular subject to death, let's review another time. Conventionally, humans and chimpanzees are about 99% similar if we're looking at the functional protein coding regions of the genome. If we take the entire thing into account, conventional numbers put that as 96%, so that's going to be including things like indels. I've said that I wouldn't be surprised if this number dropped to around 95% once we fully sequence the chimpanzee genome to the extent that the human is 100% completed every single base pair. And this is for allowing for things like telomeric regions and centromeric regions and potentially differences in other um, non-examined, non-coding DNA, some of those difficult to align, repeat heavy areas of the genome. And I wish I could say again that that was for me, but I actually took that from a comment made by Steve Schaffner who worked on the original assembly of the chimpanzee genome, and this was in a conversation he was having with Richard Bugs, who we'll talk about later. Carter talks a little bit about how Glenn Williamson was the one to first point out that Jeffrey Tompkins' most recent paper, that 2018 one, the one that had the issues with the weighting, indeed had issues with weighting, and then he says this. See, what Tompkins did was he generated a whole lot of data, 
and you use a computer program called BLAST, which is searching from a, from a query onto a target, a query sequence to a target database. And he said, okay, I'm gonna take this chimpanzee sequence and I'm gonna search the human genome to find a match. And the computer program is gonna reply um, where the match is, which he didn't record, um, how long the match is, what the percent identity is, and other, other statistics like that. And all he did was take the, um, the percent identity column for 18,000 readings and take the average. And that was an incorrect thing to do. I know I clown a little bit on this video and on this channel, but I do want to take another opportunity to thank Robert Carter for actually pointing out being the only young earth creationist who has previously agreed with Jeffrey Tompkins to come forward and say no, upon closer examination, it does seem that Tompkins is wrong and that his methodology was inappropriate and thus his, his results are erroneous. So thank you again, Dr. Carter. You're the only one I've seen do this. So Carter summarizes what Glenn did, which is the same thing that I repeated earlier in this video, how in that Tomkins CSV file that he published, if you actually weight his data, you see that it meets conventional expectations, that the human and chimpanzee genome are indeed like 96% similar to one another. And to that, Carter says this. And fair, that, that is one way to do it. So he agrees that this is an appropriate method by which to glean overall percent similarity. To take this sequence length into account when summarizing all of your alignments. And I'm glad that this is his kind of final perspective on the type of weighting as pointed out by Ruhif and then secondarily by myself, because it seemed to me like in the previous video that we looked at in this larger review of Carter's unintentional series, it seemed to me like he was kind of saying, no, um, what Tomkins was doing wasn't necessarily wrong. Waiting wasn't necessarily the issue because I was going to get him on this one. I reached out to several individuals who do comparative genomics and asked point blank, like, is waiting by sequence length considered appropriate? And they were like, yeah, I literally cannot think of any other way that you would do it. Like, why would you not wait by sequence length? Taking the length of the sequence into account is absolutely critical. Waiting is not always appropriate. I know um, uh, Erica said, it doesn't matter what your sample size is, Jeff, you have to wait things no matter what. E no, that's not quite true. Now I would really like for him to elaborate on this one before we bring down the hammer. Because, I mean, Tompkins said, look, I had 18,000 data points. That should be a nice round average. I mean, he didn't say that, I added that part. That, that should give me a good, robust average. And that's true if your data are normally distributed. You know, the old bell curve. So is what Carter's saying here that he could have simply averaged his data points if we'd had a normal distribution, because I'm struggling to think of a single genomic comparison between two organisms that's going to yield a normal distribution. Like I've had to normalize data before running statistical analyses before, but like if all types of genomic comparisons, or at least the vast majority, and again, I can't think of an exception, so I'm kind of just covering my butt here, but like if most of them are going to be non-normally distributed, then wouldn't it be fair to say that you're almost always going to weight your data? And thus that in a genomic comparison, weighting the data should in fact be the default? Again, I reached out to several comparative genomics folks and asked that question point blank. Is there ever a scenario where you will not weight your data by sequence length? And they all said no. I mean, everybody I talked to said no. But okay, let's, let's go with Carter on this one, right? If, in fact, you need to check to see if your data are normally distributed first, did Tompkins do that? Because the thing about statistics is one of the first things they teach you is how to visualize your data. And in fact, how important it actually is to see how your data plot before you run any kind of statistical analyses, because it is that plotting that's going to tell you whether or not you have a bell curve and thus a normal distribution or non-normal distribution. It is that simple. What I'm saying is if he did plot his data and he didn't have a normal distribution, there is not any excuse out there on the planet for him to treat that data as if it were normal. So what do you think Tomkins did? In fact, in his paper, he has a chart where he's got a big old peak on the left side and it trails off, it's skewed toward the right. 
There's some that are millions of letters long, but most of them, in fact, the mode is 1004. So almost all the sequences are about 1000 letters long. That's not a normally distributed data set. So let me see if I've got this right here, Dr. Carter. You're saying that it was inappropriate for Glenn to point out that Tompkins simply took an average instead of taking the length into account. And you're basically saying you have to check if the data is normally distributed or not. And in the case that the data is non-normally distributed, then you can't take the average. So you're basically saying that, yeah, Glenn is right, but not for the right reasons. Or yeah, Eric is right, but not for the right reasons. So to that, again, I respond and say, I can't think of a single genomic comparison between two organisms where you're going to end up with normally distributed data. Uh, but then what you said was, it's very easy to tell if the data is normally distributed or not. All you have to do is plot it. And then you pointed to a plot in Tompkins's paper that showed it was not normally distributed. And then just that he just still did treat it as if it were normally distributed. So in kind of deconstructing or attempting to deconstruct the criticism that Glenn and I had of Tompkins, you've made Tompkins look a fair bit worse here, in my opinion. I want to sum up my issues on this waiting thing because I kind of feel like Carter has done a little bit of a bait and switch. When he says this, Waiting is not always appropriate. He is correct if we're referring to data in general. You do need to check and see if your data are normally distributed. And if they are, simple averages are going to be a lot easier to utilize. But if they're not, as Carter mentioned, you have to use some workarounds. You can't just take a brute average. But the problem is, in genomic comparisons, as I've said several times before, I don't think there's going to be a case where you're going to have normally distributed data, especially if you're using contiguous sequences because the length isn't standardized. Even then though, you're going to have a lot that are like 100% or close to 100% if you're looking at very closely related organisms and fewer that trail off as you see these smaller repetitive sequences enter into the analysis. Genomic comparisons typically deal with non-normally distributed data, but if you want to go through the song and dance, you can check to see if your data are normally distributed or not. Tomkins checked, and he still used the wrong method. That is just his normal state of being. He does it unironically. Man's collected all the infinity stones of cringe and ascended to a level beyond pathetic. The data weren't normally distributed. He was using genomic data in the first place, so he should have known right off the bat, especially since he was using contigs, that you can't just take the average, and yet that's still, despite those two roadblocks, exactly what he did. And Carter points it out as well. But it's the percent identity scores, the column that he averaged, that's the problem. You can't just average that. That's not the right way to do it. So let's make something abundantly clear here. Glenn and I pointed out that Tompkins didn't weight his data. Carter said, no, no, it's not just that because sometimes weighting data is inappropriate. What he should have done is tested to see if the data were normal and then chosen whether or not to weight it. And what he did is check whether or not the data were normally distributed, found that they were not, and still took an average, which as Carter, Glenn and I have all pointed out, you cannot do. So Carter goes on to give an alternative way of weighting the data, um, and he gets an alternative percent similarity between humans and chimps. See if you can guess what it is. Now, I, someone somewhere along the line suggested what I'm about to say is incorrect, but I think there's a better way to do it. And your percent similarity drops. Not by a lot. I wish it was a lot, but it, it ends up in a 94% range. So instead of 96, you're probably talking about 94. Now, there might be reasons why that's incorrect. The 94% range. Now, there are some reasons, I think, as to why it's a bit higher than that. But like, even if it was 94%, Sure. Again, the big important thing is contextualizing the human and chimpanzee genomic similarity with the similarities of other organisms that creationists accept as related. Then Carter points out that those contiguous sequences as used by Tompkins might not even be a fair sampling of the chimpanzee genome anyways, and he's probably right on that. That's fine, which is why I tend to accept the conventional number that took all of this into account from 2018, which shows that humans and chimps are about 96% similar to one another when looking at the entire genome. If they're not a fair sampling, you can wait six ways to Sunday and you're not going to get the right answer. It's not going to improve if your data are biased. 
So Dr. Carter here is adding an additional problem to Tompkins' methodology. This is not a nitpick on Glenn and I. He's basically saying, yeah, the weighting would be a problem, but there are other additional problems from the data set before it was even analyzed. And like, okay, thank you for that, Dr. Carter. I'll keep that in mind. Now that's a minor issue, but that, that all this uh, hot air, that's, not, that's a little bit insulting, sorry. All this time has been spent by Tompkins' opponents railing on him that he didn't weight his data. And yeah, it's true, he probably should have, but the first step that must be done is you must look to see if the data fairly represent the chimpanzee genome, and no one's done that. Dr. Carter, Tompkins should have done that. Glenn and I are not responsible for finding every single error with Jeffrey Tompkins' work. It's bad enough that he didn't weight the data, as you said. It already, that in and of itself, makes the study bunk. But, like, you can add additional problems. I mean, you've done that here. I find that helpful. It's good to know the other ways in which Jeffrey Tompkins is incorrect. But, like, you're just adding to the pile. To me, this feels like pointing at the waiting problem and saying, you guys are spending way too much time on this one problem instead of appreciating all of the smaller problems that preceded it. It doesn't really matter. We agree the waiting should have been utilized, and it wasn't. Carter talks about some other ways that you can introduce bias, and then he notes that there are significantly more contiguous sequences that haven't been placed into the chimpanzee genome yet than there are spaces for those contiguous sequences. And he's like, who knows where this is going to go once the contigs are placed, right? Like, how can we really have any confidence at all? Or at least we shouldn't be as confident as we currently are in the status of the chimpanzee genome. And I think that it's important to note that it's appreciated by most that the, the sequences that haven't been placed into the chimpanzee, it's mostly repetitive elements. And it's pretty hard to figure out how to count repetitive elements as differences. How do you tell how different repetitive elements are in one organism versus another? Suppose the human genome has TAG a hundred times, and the chimpanzee genome has duplicated that entire region three times. Well, if you compare the human section to the chimp section, you're going to get a hundred percent match, because that entire chunk can be aligned from the human to the chimpanzee. But if you do it the opposite direction, and you take the entire repetitive sequence, so that original hundred time TAG, and then three more times, so a total of 400 TAG repeats, and you align that chimp section to the human, it's only going to show up as being like a 25% match. These are some of the challenges faced by folks who study comparative genomics. How do you actually treat things like copy number variations or highly repetitive sequences? This is a question that they ask and have to grapple with, but Carter is bringing it up here as if this is something that has never been considered, and I find that a little bit silly. So, uh, Ruhif, Gutsa Gibbon, um, Dapper Dino, um, I'm not convinced that that's the right approach. I'm just saying. But there's something worse than that, so we'll get to that. I would encourage you to reach out to folks who do comparative genomics, maybe ask some of the same people that I did, and run that by them. Because my understanding is that weighting and appreciating sequence length is absolutely imperative. And that's why I double triple check this, because I do think you're wrong here, Dr. Carter. Not weighting the sequences is the issue, and providing an alternative means to weight, or simply the logic behind why one must weight the sequences, does not change that. Dr. Ian Korf, you might remember him from earlier, this great little book with the coelacanth on the cover that all the scientists in genetics had, confirmed this for me and added that Tompkins' entire study design is flawed fundamentally. He pointed out that chimps and humans have orthologous introns that are about 95% similar due to drift. So how is it even possible to get 70% identity when 95% is neutral? Would Tompkins argue selection for these areas? Korf notes that they are surely non-syntenic repeats and that this issue doomed the study before any analyses could be carried out. He also pointed out that an e-value of 10 given the rest of his methods was just absurd. But that's fine. It doesn't actually matter because in the end, you, me, Glenn, and Dapper Dino all agree that what Tompkins did do was wrong. The second huge issue that Tompkins can beat over the head on is something called gapping. Hmm, I can hear my execution bells ringing because this is getting into the material that I was incorrect about. Ruhif starts us off in his video. And 
Erica or Gutza Gibbon had a a screenshot of a paper that he supposedly tried to submit to Answers Research Journal. Supposedly? But Rob Carter, you watched my previous video. You watched the entire email exchange that I went through between Glenn Williamson, Jeffrey Tompkins, and Andrew Snelling. You know he tried to submit it. I don't work for Answers in Genesis. I have no inside information on this paper, um, what what the, in, the, the back and forth was. I, I have no idea. I'm an outside observer, and I've only heard the story from... Uh, from Gutsuck Gibbon herself in her video. So I don't know what happened there, but this paper supposedly got submitted. Truth be told, I think Carter's covering his butt here. I think he knows that Answers in Genesis is like on the war path right now, as evidenced by their weird tirade against the young earth evolutionists that I covered in this video. It's highly inappropriate and really mean and uncool to a lot of young earth creationists that have been amicable towards Answers in Genesis for quite some time, but that's neither here nor there. I think Carter is, I think you're smart here for staying out of the fray, but come on. Supposedly, um, full disclosure though, I, I think I have a copy of that paper. I'm not sure how I got it. I don't remember where it came from. Huh. But I, something clued my memory after doing this for a couple of weeks and I did a search on my laptop. Oh, there it is. Whoa, look at that. Well, uh, the, the paper copy or the, the PDF copy I have exactly matches uh, Erica's screenshots. Huh. So, um... Dapper Dinosaur, that this PDF is floating around. Erica has a copy. I don't remember how I got a copy. Honestly, I don't. Um, I could probably search on my emails to see who sent it to me, maybe. Uh, but I do have a copy of it. You know what? You made some valid points. Well, now this is very interesting. So Robert Carter has a copy of the paper that Glenn Williamson tried to submit to the ARJ way back when. Curious, curious, curious. And very very fascinating. That was LARPy, wasn't it? Hold on. Ow. I'll do that every time from here on out. But there is a glaring error in that paper. A huge error. Uh, Gutsa Gibbon rep repeats that error verbatim. She does it again with a different set of letters. She does it again with a longer set of letters. Uh, Ruhif uh, introduced the error. Gutsa Gibbon repeated it, and Dapper Dino had a, a, a new iteration of that. Hmm. The time is nigh. Let's repeat the clip from my video just to refresh your memory. Again, I know we're about two hours in. The ungap parameter determines whether to account for small indels in the comparison. Indel is a portmanteau of the words insertion and deletion, and it refers to insertion and deletion events that can occur in the genome. Insertions refers to when one or more base pairs end up inserted in a place where they weren't previously, and deletion is the opposite. One or more base pairs ends up deleted from where they should be. Suppose we have a nucleotide sequence of 13 base pairs. If the ungap parameter is used and there is a putative single nucleotide insertion in one of the sequences, then the BLAST algorithm cannot continue the alignment. Obviously, the first six nucleotides are identical in this example, but there seems to be an extra A in the query sequence which prevents the alignment from continuing any further. If the BLAST algorithm is unconstrained by the ungapped parameter, and we are using a gapped parameter, it is clever enough to insert a gap into the subject sequence, and that gap represents a putative insertion or deletion. So now we have the following alignment. The first example corresponds to the ungapped behavior and will report only six identical nucleotides in a query 13 nucleotides long for 46% similarity or identity. The second example allows for small insertions and deletions and will report that 12 out of the 13 nucleotides match, being 92% identical. That is um, now become an urban myth. That's not what we're talking about. Yes, if you have, if you look at the total sequence differences, you'll get a vast difference if you don't allow for spaces. But the program being used is the basic local alignment and search tool. Recall from earlier in the video, this video, and also from the video initially, the bogus creationism of Jeffrey Tompkins, that I utilized his parameters as published in the original 2013 paper and then in the anomaly paper and attempted to compare several different organisms that he had not 
deigned to compare. So comparisons outside of the human and the chimp. And I'm going to flash some of the results here. Um, I had them in like screenshot format from that video. You'll notice that they're very low for pretty much everything, including ridiculously similar organisms that everyone would accept as related, such as breeds of cow or human population groups. The big punchline was when I showed that using Tomkins's parameters in my own config file, you couldn't actually get a 100% similarity of a chunk of human chromosome to itself. And I thought that was really awesome and a great smackdown of Jeffrey Tompkins. But Carter says some kind words to me. Um, so Erica is um, producing a lot of data. She's doing a lot of comparisons and this is hard work. And I complimented her on, in my last video and I'm, I'm gonna hold that compliment. Um, Erica, you're doing a lot of hard work. Now I'm gonna disagree with some of your things and I hope you can take my criticism, but you're really working hard on this. And then he goes on to talk a little bit about my good parameters. So those of you will remember that to contextualize Jeffrey Tompkins' results, I had a good method that was more in line with what I would expect from conventional science to utilize as opposed to what Jeffrey Tompkins was utilizing. And to that, Carter says... And what she's calling the good version of BLAST, which is honestly just the default settings. Yes, they are the default settings. I say this in the video, like he kind of says this here as if it's like, yeah, she said she came up with these really good settings, but honestly, they're just the default. She like clearly didn't put that much thought into it or do a lot of legwork for that good methodology. But it's just like, I, I know I said that in the video here. And the method that I'm using for like good, for like our conventional science method is this one here titled uh, good max target sequence right there. Those are mostly just default parameters, uh, but that's going to give us what like a, an approximation of what conventional methods would get. And well, I can do default settings also. In fact, most all of my searches have been default setting. The thousands and thousands of blast searches that I've been doing over the last month, I'm doing them in pairs. And I'll do a search with gapped and a search with ungapped parameter. I wouldn't deign to take credit for crafting the default parameters, Dr. Carter. So he sets up the premise of what he's getting ready to do here, right? He's going to check my work on Jeffrey Tompkins's work to see if it is in fact the ungapped parameter that is causing all the problems. And the way he's going to do this is by running a bunch of different comparisons in uh, using the gap parameter versus using the ungapped parameter. And specifically, that's going to be the only parameter he's changing. He summarizes my results and talks about how for the Tompkins methodology that I was utilizing in this 2011 to 2015 test of his methods and attempt at recapitulating what he had done, that I was getting mostly middle 80s numbers for basically every pair of organisms. And I looked at that and I was like, okay, there's, there's definitely something wrong with the methodology. And I double, triple checked that I was pulling directly from the paper, his parameters into my config file. And then Carter says of my methods. Her methods give you like 98% similarity, 99% similarity, 100% similarity. If you're comparing something to itself. But the thing is my methods, I get 100% similarity, whether I use gaps or not if I'm comparing something to itself. I can't validate her work. You'll notice my tough guy jacket has disappeared and I'm about to don the humility hat. It's never good when someone can't replicate your results. That is what you call in the biz a bad sign. But if I do the same thing with Erica's things, which is essentially just the default parameters, I don't get the same results. And that concerns me. But things get a little bit worse. Carter does a lot of different comparisons using the human and the chimp put an asterisk there, and consistently across the board, his gapped parameter is yielding lower percent similarity than his ungapped parameter, which is exactly the opposite of what I implied would happen in my Tompkins video. In fact, I blamed Tompkins low similarities almost entirely on the ungapped parameter, at least for his 2011 to 2015 work. Now, Erica, ungapped produces much 
higher percent similarities, as it should. Carter says this after going through a lot of theory with Blast, the program. Like, he read the manual. I mean, this guy goes through it in depth. Each parameter, what it does in Blast, and how it should, theoretically, impact the results. Then, he rubs a little salt in the wound and reads a quote directly from me. Erica said, you end up with non-100% identities of an entity to itself. You can't get a 100% identity of something to itself when using the ungapped parameter. That, that's not true. And in fact, I'm going to show you why that's not true, both conceptually and then experimentally. That's not true. In fact, shocker, using the ungapped parameter setting gives you a higher percent identity on average. When I was watching this initially, this part really made me mad. I saw this and I was like, that's ridiculous. There's no way that's true. And then I went back to my computer and I started playing around the, with the parameters outside of just comparing a good default methodology to Jeffrey Tompkins. I played with the default methods and only changed gapped versus ungapped. And Carter's right here. Oh dear, that's not good. I feel the need to say the F word now. Now, it didn't change very much, but still, ungapped was giving me higher percent similarities than gapped. And at this point, I was like, oh no, what happened? So let's do an interesting little postmortem here. Let's do an autopsy of my methodology and of Tomkin's methodology in a way. And we're going to start with trying to figure out what's going on with the gapped versus ungapped. And then we're going to talk about why Carter couldn't replicate my results. Okay, so we're back in the config file, and it should look kind of familiar, except I've trimmed the fat. So we have good gapped, which is the same thing as the original default good in my previous video. We have good ungapped, which is the same exact thing, except ungapped. So this is what we're going to use to test Carter's hypothesis. We have Tomkins 2013, Tomkins 2013 with max HSPS, which we'll get to in a minute, and Tomkins 2018. So this is the config file. This is what it looks like. Let's play around with Blast and see what happens. All right, so now we are back in the terminal and we are going to do a quick little comparison here using my methodology, using uh, my program, the program that my husband made for me. And we're gonna see what happens with, with what Carter said here, comparing the gapped versus the ungapped, both being good otherwise, no other Tomkins parameters or shenanigans, just looking at the difference between gapped and ungapped. So we'll do a comparison of the human to the chimp. We're just looking at chromosome one here. Chromosome one is the only thing in this FASTA file. We're going to look at the chromosome one. It's the only thing there. We're going to take a look at 100 sequences in each of those 100 sequences, if you will remember, is 300 base pairs long. And we're going to start with the gap. So we're going to use our good gapped method. What it's going to do is it's going to generate all of those um, individual like random sequences of uh, 300 base pairs each and then it's going to align them and voila the weighted similarity and that's the only thing we need to worry about for the time being is 98.07 percent that's about what we would expect even though we're looking at a really small uh, like set of sequences here so now let's try it with ungapped we will do the same thing, make sure we're comparing our human to our chimpanzee here. It's going to use the existing databases. Again, we're just looking at chromosome one, and this doesn't matter because chromosome one is the only thing in the FASTA file, but those other options are for if you're looking at an entire genome. Again, we're going to do 100 base pairs, or excuse me, 100 sequences of 300 base pairs, and this time we're going to use good ungap. So typically the ungapped takes a shorter amount of time. Um, and what you're going to see here is the weighted similarity is 98.39%. So Carter is right. In the case of the two comparisons, the comparison that we were looking at there, where we had good methodology, more or less default methods, uh, but just changing the gap versus the ungapped parameter, ungapped gives higher percent similarity. But a couple of things were weird about this. The first was, if I'd screwed this up so monumentally, why on earth had my human-to-chimp comparisons using Tomkins' methods 
approximated his so well. They were a little bit different, but I chalked that up to the fact that we were both using random slices, and they were probably just slightly different slices that overall were giving the same pictures because they were sampled randomly, but were a little bit different, perhaps a decimal point here and there. And the second thing that was weird was that Glenn Williamson had posed the gap versus ungap problem to Tompkins and Snelling directly when he had tried to submit that paper. Why hadn't Tompkins pointed this out to Glenn? Something was missing. So I emailed Glenn. And while I was waiting for him, I went back to his paper. And so here we are, back at the paper that started it all. Dr. Tompkins falls victim to software bug in chimpanzee comparison by Glenn Williamson. So the first thing I did is I scrolled down to the gapped and ungapped summary, and I wanted to make sure that I hadn't misunderstood this on like a fundamental level, but no, sure enough, this is exactly how I explained it in the video. When the extra A and insertions shows up in this example comparison, using the ungapped parameter, the alignment will in fact stop. So wait, what the heck was going on in my comparison in Blast and in Carter's comparison. In Carter's video, he actually does a great job explaining precisely what's going on. The alignment stops, but Blast will report that match in the output CSV file, and it will be a 100% match. Then the gap will be skipped over, and the alignment will start again. So that's why the percent similarity ends up a lot higher, it's just that the pieces themselves are a lot smaller. Using the ungapped parameter setting gives you a higher percent identity on average. Higher, not lower. Now, you get shorter match lanes, fine. But on average, you get higher percent identities, and it doesn't matter which genomes you're comparing. Except when you compare something to itself, you get 100% no matter what you do. We'll come back to that last part, but first let's check out our own CSV file and see if that is in fact what happened. So I'm not 100% sure why all the links aren't 300 exactly, but I have an inkling that it's because these chromosomes that I downloaded from Ensemble, they're pretty old assemblies, and they're meant to prove a point here, so it doesn't matter how complete they are, but I bet they're just running into ends, I think that's what's going on. Um, but either way, what you'll notice is that if we go to our gapped uh, table, which is right here, and we sort smallest to largest by length, it's going to take a minute because it's got to think, and you'll notice that all of our alignments are pretty long. If we do the same, though, and we head on over to our blue, our ungapped, which is right here, and we do the same thing, sort by length, what we will find is that there are quite a few more shorter lengths. Like, there are a lot more incomplete matches. And that's because, like we said, it will start to align, it'll encounter a gap, it'll cha-ching, rip that receipt off, stick it in the CSV, and then restart the alignment on the other side. So it's exactly like Carter said. The percent similarities are quite high for most of these, higher even in the ungapped than in the gapped, but the queries themselves, the actual matches, are shorter in length, and that's not even exemplified very well on this 100-300 base pair long, um, analysis that I did. Obviously, when you're looking at thousands or tens of thousands, this fact becomes a lot more evident. So what's the deal with the discrepancy then? What's going on with what Glenn is saying with this gapped ungapped problem versus what Carter has found and what I've now been able to repeat? Well, let's return again back to Glenn's paper. You see, Glenn doesn't stop at just explaining the issue with the gapped and ungapped. Now, when I read this initially, I was like, okay, check. This makes sense. Putting this in the video, done, 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 read all the emails, makes sense. It's a gapped and ungapped problem. And I didn't pay enough attention to what came next. So as you scroll down, you will hit the money shot of Glenn Williamson's paper here. So first in this paragraph on the section gapped versus ungapped experiment, he talks a little bit about how there's almost certainly a bug in Tomkins' version of BLAST from 2013, but then he goes on to say that there are still significant corrections to be made to Dr. Tomkins' methodology before arriving at a reliable result, meaning the problems extend past just the bug in BLAST. He says, as mentioned in the materials and methods section, Dr. Tomkins employs the ungapped parameter in a setting where he presumably intends 
to report a result that includes indels, because I didn't mention this earlier, and I can't remember if Carter mentioned it or not, but when you use the ungap parameter, the indels, those gaps themselves, they don't get included at all. In the gap parameter, the, the algorithm is capable of jumping over that gap and then incorporating it into that percent similarity, hence why the gapped percent similarity is actually lower, as Carter noted. Since the ungap parameter returns results that exclude insertions and deletions, it should be only used to calculate the substitution rate or mutation rate between two species. That is, if Dr. Tompkins intended to report a similarity that excluded indels, he should be reporting a figure to the order of 98.5%. This is 100% true, and I cannot believe I didn't see this earlier, because he's absolutely right. Like, Tompkins shouldn't even be getting the 95-96% because he's excluding the indels. He should be getting 98 plus percent. But Glenn goes on. He says Dr. Tompkins' calculation method to arrive at a final figure is also inappropriate given his use of the ungap parameter. He calculates an average percent query identity by taking into account the length of the alignment, the average alignment length, as a percentage of the length of the query, average query sequence length. So Carter, I'm sure at this moment your, your light bulb just went off and you were like, oh shit, to be perfectly honest. I, I know you don't like the swearing, but I feel like that's actually appropriate. For those of you who don't know the, the punchline here, we're about to talk about it. With approximately 5 million insertion and deletion events across the two genomes, and the BLAST algorithm intentionally constrained from continuing alignments through those putative indels, this will obviously produce shorter alignment uh, average lengths. In short, if Dr. Tompkins wishes to factor in the length of the alignment as a percentage of the length of the query, then he must allow the BLAST algorithm to extend alignments through putative indels, and is therefore completely inappropriate to use the ungapped parameter. He is 100% correct, and again, I can't believe I was too lazy to read through the entirety of the paper and make sure I understood the entire thing 100% before going on with my video. But as I've said before, I should have taken it more seriously. I was treating it like a YouTube project and I, I should have been more professional about it. For those of you who were like, oh my gosh, I still don't get it. Let me explain. So here we are back at our ungapped results for a comparison of chimpanzee chromosome 1 to human chromosome 1. And again, we were looking at 100, roughly 300 base pair sequences, but the average is a little bit less than 300 because again, we're working with really old um, assemblies of this chromosome. It doesn't matter for the point I'm trying to make. So what did Tompkins do? He took an average length and then took a percentage of that length. So let me show you what I mean. So first Tompkins goes and he averages the length column. So this is equal to an average of the length column. And the average length, the mean length of all of these lengths is 274.9 base pairs. So like, let's, let's call it 275, 275 base pairs. So if you took a percent of this, and that's what Tompkins did, what do you actually get? So equals our number over here times the average length, 92.81%. That is quite a bit lower than what BLAST was actually reporting, and this is what Tompkins did. So Dr. Carter, the problem here is those shorter, higher percentage alignments. That's part of the issue. What you said, and you were right in saying so, is that using the ungap will get higher percent identity, but the, the, the chunks themselves, the sequences themselves, are going to be quite a bit shorter. That's the problem. And that's why Tompkins is taking an average length and then taking a percentage of that average length. Now, you shouldn't be taking the average length and then taking a percentage of it at all, really, at least not in my opinion, but doing that plus utilizing the ungapped parameter is absolutely indefensible, especially given Tompkins was clear, as Glenn pointed out, that he wanted to include indels and he'd criticized other organizations, secular groups, secular studies for not including indels and popularizing that 98% number. Hold on, I hear you saying. Erica, you didn't point this out though. And you're right, I didn't. I didn't appreciate this portion. I saw the gapped and ungapped, that made sense to me, and my numbers were, again, approximating Tomkins' numbers, so I was like, well, I must be on the right track here. I didn't see a reason, I didn't have any data points stick out at me to spur me to think, okay, maybe I'm doing something wrong here, and then go back and re-examine Glenn's paper. 
that's my bad. And I guess you would only know that that was the real issue if you had access to Glenn's paper, since everybody, including myself, who's popularized it, has left it out. You would only know it if you had that paper. Like, for instance, in your email. Um, full disclosure, though, I, I think I have a copy of that paper. I'm not sure how I got it. I don't remember where it came from, but I... Something clued my memory after doing this for a couple of weeks and I did a search on my left. Oh, there it is. Oh, whoa, look at that. Well, uh, the, the paper copy I, or the, the PDF copy I have exactly matches uh, Erica's screenshots. So, um... <sighs> that sucks. That's, uh, I mean... <laughs> you knew that I got that argument from Glenn, Dr. Carter. I made that abundantly clear. You mention it in this video. And you didn't think to maybe go check that paper to see what his original argument was? You talk about how the paper makes egregious errors. I have no choice but to believe you read some of it. Did you do the same thing I did and you just read that first portion of the Gapped and Ungapped and you were like, mm, that looks good. And I hope I'm not throwing a stone in a glass house here, but... Then again, this video that you've created is like a specific reputation, like in large part of that gapped and ungapped argument. So, you know, you would think that maybe you would want to cover all of your bases there to avoid a situation like this. Because I'm sitting here eating crow, not for being wrong that ungapped isn't a massive portion of Jeffrey Tompkins' problem, but for having an incomplete explanation as to why ungapped is one of Jeffrey Tompkins' biggest problems. I didn't see it because I was only ever comparing my good default methods to Jeffrey Tompkins' methodology, which was chock full of other problems as we will see shortly and some of which you've already pointed out. I was using Glenn's work as a small part of a larger piece debunking Jeffrey Tompkins. You're spending this video debunking me, Glenn, and Dapper Dinosaur. So I don't know why you didn't choose to read the entire paper since you have it, or reach out to Glenn, or reach out to Jeff and get some more in-depth understanding as to why Ungapped is problematic. You saw what I did wrong and you ran with it. You were like, ah, got her. And, and you did, you got me. But you didn't get Glenn. And to be clear, you got me on an incomplete answer, not an incorrect one. Incomplete is still incorrect. I feel like I get partial credit, but the answer is still on the whole wrong because I didn't explain my answer properly. You would definitely lose points for that in any graduate class out there. So here I am eating crow for not doing my due diligence and fully understanding why ungapped was problematic. However, that wasn't really what was getting me. What was getting me is that I didn't catch it, right? Because I had all of these results, and as I mentioned earlier, I think I mentioned it twice now, my results approximated Tomkins' results. Why did that happen? What on earth was going on there? Because clearly I was doing something very different than what Tomkins was doing. My gapped stuff was fine, but my ungapped stuff, my Tomkins numbers, were clearly wrong. Something was going on there, and it wasn't the ungapped parameter, as Carter has pointed out. So I went to the config file to see what else could be the culprit. Part 3. Gutsick Gibbon destroys Gutsick Gibbon. We've talked about what gapped and ungapped do within BLAST as parameters, but I want to take a minute and talk about the other parameters that are utilized in my own and in Tomkins and in Carter's methodologies because they're kind of important. We already mentioned this, but gapped versus ungapped determines how BLAST handles indels. Reward penalty and xdrop determines how long the program will attempt to align sequences. When the xdrop is met, the alignment will cease. The dust and masking parameters determines how BLAST will handle repeats and masked regions in the query or the database. The max target sequence parameter determines the maximum number of target sequences that are reported as hits. And the max HSPS function determines the maximum number of high-scoring pairs that are reported in the results. This is usually one in genomic comparisons. So looking at the other differences between Tomkins 2013, which is here, and I'll shorten it so perhaps we can see a little bit better so we can see everything that we need to, um, and the good method was his use of a 10 E value, word size 11 was the same, max target sequence one, dust, no, soft masking, false, and ungapped. So if ungapped wasn't the reason, 
I knew it couldn't be soft masking false or dust no, because as I mentioned in the previous video, I intentionally utilized unmasked genomes so that these would not come into play, so that they wouldn't matter as much. Um, he has max target sequence, just like we do, and the E-value stuff is kind of inconsequential for our purposes today. Uh, but then I noticed, right, um, max HSPS. Max HSPS is missing from Jeffrey Tompkins' methods. This is big, because if Tompkins isn't using max HSPS, then he's going to be getting hundreds, if not thousands, of inappropriate partial matches all over the genome, not just the best hit. And this completely screws with BLAST's percent identity column, obviously. So if you were to average it, you're going to get an insanely low percent identity that is completely erroneous because you're just including all of these partial matches, you know, 50% match, 60% match, 70% match, which actually have nothing to do with the real alignment that exists. To use an absurd and simplified example, if you search the database for a sequence that was 10 base pairs long, ATA, GG, CAT, CG in this case, reporting partial hits, as in max HSPS is not equal to one, will report every partial match alongside the true match. So you might get one match that is 100% identical, and then you might get five more that are varying levels of similar all across the genome. Now imagine that you averaged your percent identity column for that output. You wouldn't get a 100% identity, even of something to itself. Setting max HSPS as equal to 1 ensures that only the best match is reported. So the very first thing I did was go and make sure that Jeffrey Tompkins actually wasn't using max HSPS in his parameters. So I went to go check, I found his parameters, and sure enough, blast parameters utilized were as follows. E value 10, word size 11, max target sequence 1, dust no, soft masking false, ungapped, and number of threads 6. So I saw that and I was like, okay, well, did, did Rob Carter replicate Tompkins' methods correctly? I popped on over to his GitHub associated with the video that he released, because, you know, he said he was uploading all of his programs and his uh, methodologies and things like that. And I opened it up, and sure enough, there's no max HSPS here either. So I was like, ah, that's the reason. So Carter isn't actually replicating Tomkins' methods correctly. So I was feeling good. I was feeling happy. I was like, ah, Gar Carter has made the error here. But I wanted to double check, so I went and reread all of Jeffrey Tomkins' stuff again, and as you know, there's quite a bit of it, and it's a difficult read, and I realized, uh-oh, the reason Tompkins doesn't have max HSPS in that 2015 test is because he was running it on an older version of Blast where max HSPS was default. And now against all odds, I feel weird and bad. No one could have seen this coming. The point being, he was utilizing max HSPS, and I wasn't when I was replicating his methods. So all of those Tomkins results for the 2011 to 2015, they don't matter. They're wrong. Well, it's been a great day today. Can't wait for more. <laughs> And that includes my beloved bust of how Tompkins' methods can't even return 100% similarity of something to itself. That was because I was utilizing the non-max HSPS Tompkins parameter. It sucks because I copied and pasted the parameters directly into my config file, thinking that that would kind of avoid any potential for misconstruing his methods or missing something or the other. But it turns out I was just using a, a too new, a too modern version of Blast. That was my downfall. But you can't be mad because you see, the whole thing was an accident. So wow, yikes, no excuse for this one, right? Like this is just a regular run of the mill bona fide mistake. This isn't an incomplete answer. This is a big old goof up, bad. And like, I know you know, because we've talked about it earlier, but not utilizing max HSPS, like I should have known because that is super, super bad, even for Tompkins. That's absurd. You would have to be the biggest intentional liar on the planet or really, really bad at genetics to not utilize max HSPS in your genomic comparison.
like, let me just show you the consequences of something like this, right? So I'm doing the same thing as we did before, but instead of using a human and a chimp, I'm using the human versus itself. So human chromosome one compared to a legitimate copy of human chromosome one. We're doing a hundred sequences again, and we're going to use my original Tomkins 2013, which lacks the max HSPS function. Now, typically this takes a hot minute, so you'll forgive me if I fast forward us through this. I mean, goodness, I really should have caught this. Like, this is just insane. This is ridiculous. Looking at this, weighted, unweighted, or God forbid you use Tomkins' weighting scheme on this erroneous Tomkins methodology, uh, it is just a mess. I mean, again, you would have to be a real bonehead to actually not use max HSPS, uh, and Tomkins, thankfully, is better than that. I point this out because Carter seriously harps on the fact that he couldn't replicate my results, and that's understandable, uh, but it is kind of interesting that he spends so much time talking about mine when he also couldn't replicate Tompkins' results. I can validate Tompkins' results. Now, I don't agree with his conclusions, but if I do what he did, I'll, I'll get the same numbers, essentially, in my small data set. Okay, I'm adding a second note in post-production here. I did a lot more work on that question of can I reproduce Tompkins' numbers. It uh, turns out that I can't. Uh, I do not get uh, that, that peak around 69%. Uh, that he got, but I did not get values as low as his. And when I graph my results versus his results, my results are generally higher. Now, when I use an ungapped search, they're a lot higher. In fact, between his like 70% range became 95% similarity. But if I use an gap search like he did, uh, his 70% range goes up to maybe 75% or something like that. So. Uh, in general, allowing for gaps gives you worse percent identities. Even though you might get a longer stretch, you get a, a worse match. Um, but I cannot get to his numbers to pop out of the, the data. I, I'm not reproducing them. I'm only kind of approximating them. That bugs me, uh, but right now that's the best I can do. So I want to round off this section by saying, Dr. Carter, you know why you couldn't replicate mine now, hopefully. Uh, so maybe you should figure out why you couldn't replicate Tompkins. Now, Dr. Carter didn't figure this out. He seems to think that there's some kind of bug in my program. I found that very irritating because my husband is extremely good at his job, arguably better at his job than I am at mine. Uh, so no, Dr. Carter, there isn't a bug in the program. It was just a bona fide knucklehead mistake on my end. Really, it puts me into wingnut or knucklehead McSpazitron territory, how goofy that was for me to think that Tompkins wouldn't use max HSPS. I mean, that, like I said, that's just unthinkable, even for Tompkins, who I think is, is quite bad at his job, but he wouldn't do that. Tompkins simply would not run a comparative genomics analysis and have multiple matches for the same alignment and then like average those to get a percent identity. He would not do that. Jeffrey Tompkins would not do that. He just, he wouldn't. He wouldn't be that stupid. He wouldn't be that goofy. There's no way he would make such an asinine mistake. He wouldn't. He wouldn't not use max HSPS or its equivalent in whatever even program we're looking at. He wouldn't not use it in a genomic comparison. There's just not a shot because if you were to do that, that that might make you a top contender for the world's worst geneticist. It's hard to understate how crazy this next little bit gets, and I'm gonna have to put on my dunking hat for this portion because, well, it appears that the work of Jeffrey Tompkins from 2011 all the way to 2018 is actually worse than how I presented it in my original video. That last little bit, that mistake that I made where I didn't use Max HSPS when ostensibly Tompkins was utilizing it, sent me down something of a rabbit trail. That's probably a mischaracterization. As you'll see, it's more of a rabbit descent into hell. Because you see, I thought it was really, really weird that my numbers with the max HSPS not being utilized in Tompkins' methods or my replication, attempted replication of them, it was weird to me 
that they were still really close to the numbers that he reported in that documented anomaly paper, the one from 2015. But it wasn't just that they were close to his blast numbers, no. In fact, they were actually a bit closer to his numbers from the corresponding tests he ran in Last Z and Nookmer. So here we've returned to Jeffrey Tompkins' 2015 piece, The Documented Anomaly Paper. And if we scroll down just a little bit in the abstract, you'll see that Tompkins mentions that he has rerun a lot of his 2013 analyses or his entire 2013 analyses. Uh, and he has also done the same analysis in two other programs that are used for comparative genomics. Now, we didn't talk really about these at all in the previous video because it's like, okay, well, we found problems in BLAST, so he's probably doing something dumb in Last Z and Nookmer as well. Um, and he is, but let's go ahead and see where he mentions it. He says, therefore, a previous study by this author in which the chimpanzee chromosomes were compared to the human was repeated using the 2225 plus version of the algorithm, in addition to the use of two other DNA pairwise algorithms, Last C and Nookmer. For both Last C and Nookmer, alignments as low as 50% identity were allowed, along with the inclusion of all repetitive sequences. The analyses within BLAST version 2225 plus and Nookmer indicate that the alignable portion portions of the current chimpanzee genome assembly are 88% similar on average to the human. The last C algorithm returned an overall average similarity of 73%. Detailed results and issues associated with each analysis uh, are discussed. So in this section of the paper, Tompkins talks a little bit about his Nookmer analysis, and he talks about how he can only align two chimpanzee chromosomes at a time because he only had 384 gigabytes of RAM available um, on each of the two servers, which I, I think that's kind of funny because that's just an insane amount of RAM. He talks a little bit about the nature of the algorithm, how it's performing multiple alignments over the entire chromosomal sequences, how he didn't need to do any slicing. Basically, he's just telling you how Nookmer is different from BLAST and how he um, utilized Nookmer in comparison to how he utilized BLAST. He says, in contrast to the default recommendations for comparing chimp to human that typically omit sequences less than 95% identity, Nookmer parameters were set to allow for the matching of regions as low as 50% identity. He talks about how he utilized um, no masking, so like he, he kept the no masking uh, theme going, which that's fine. I mean, we talked a little bit about why masking is utilized, but this is Tompkins we're talking about here. So he says, the resulting data for the return to Nookmer identities and lengths of alignments are given in tables four and five, respectively. The individual alignments within chromosomes varied in their percent identity between a low of 57% and a high of 100%. The average percent identity across the chromosomes was 80 percent. So if we scroll down, we can find his tables. And I'm sure you can already see what's weird here, right? He's reporting a minimum and maximum alignment and then reporting the median and mean for those alignments. He does it again in table five, where he's got his minimum and maximum uh, statistics for the aligned queries against the target or the databases. Uh, I think he's just doing this in base pairs here instead of in percent identities. And then he's reporting um, the, the median and the mean, which again is weird for reasons we've talked about earlier. And then he has his last Z algorithm analysis here. He talks about how he utilized last Z with specific parameters that he had listed earlier, and then he gives the resulting data for the last Z identities and lengths of alignments, and he talks about how the overall chromosomal average was only 73%, with the average chromosomal identity varying between 68 and 78%. And so here we are again. We have our minimum and our maximum for alignments all above 50%, but some of them barely in the minimum sense, and then again for the base pair lengths themselves. And those low percentages combined with the higher percentages looked really, really familiar to me. So I emailed Glenn again, and I asked him what was going on here in his opinion, because he had done a pretty big deep dive on this. And Glenn informed me that he hadn't looked at the last C stuff, but he had looked at the Nookmer stuff. And Tompkins's Nookmer methodology is the equivalent to not using Max HSPS. Something, by the way, that Glenn mentioned to Tompkins and Snelling 
via email. Andrew Snelling responded shortly after, saying, Glenn, Jeff responded and I agree. Jeff's response being, my work represents the statistical average of all the alignments. What's the problem with that? Glenn wants to cherry pick the 97% and throw everything out. Glenn responds in a way that is incredibly apt. He says, I'm a bit stunned. I've looked at this response for an hour and I can only assume I've been misunderstood, so let me try again. He gives an additional example and finishes the message by saying, if you apply the same logic to the comparison of a human query sequence to a human chromosome, you will get one match that has a 100% identity, the homologous match, and again, several hundred other smaller matches across the chromosome. If you include these other matches, you will get a result less than 100%. Are you saying that a human sequence is anything other than 100% identical to a human chromosome? This is embarrassing. Glenn quickly adds an additional email where he runs his own analysis using Tomkins' parameters of human chromosome 20 to chimpanzee chromosome 20, finishing the email by saying, the results below it, which go on for several pages, are clearly not syntenic and have a much lower identity, and yet you include them in your calculation. You also recognize the huge amount of overlap in your paper, but didn't think to look into why? Are you going to withdraw the paper? And it got posted in the Junk Science subreddit by a friend of Ruhif's and an old pal of mine, r slash ace of spades. So let's take a look at the Nookmer analysis and, uh, and see what we can't suss out, shall we? The post here says Ruhif downloaded a copy of this script, the one that Tomkins actually published, and ran it for himself against human chromosome 20. When he used the same parameters as Tompkins, it took a few days to run, and he got results that looked as follows. S1 and E1 are the start and end points for the first file, human, and S2 and E2 are the start and end points for the matching sequences in chimpanzees. So here's start and end for human, and start and end for chimpanzees. Now, remember, when Tompkins did his Nookmer comparison, he got about 88% as a similarity for most of the human to chim comparisons. But specifically down here, since Glenn was looking at chromosome 20, we can see that for chromosome 20, Tompkins gets a mean of 87.9%, or about 88%. Heading back over to Glenn's results as posted by Ace of Spades, we can see that the human sequence from chromosome 20 is being aligned all over the chimpanzee chromosome, and the best hit is 97.44%. But it's not the only hit. In fact, this script tried to align the same general section of human chromosome 20 all over chimp chromosome 20 and reported several partial matches, 83.5%, 83.4%, 86.4%. So geneticists would look at this and they would say, oh, okay, well, we have one really good match and a lot of partial matches for the same sequence all across the chimpanzee genome. The one we should keep is the best match. That's the most likely to be the true match at 97.44%. Um, but do you know what Tomkins did? Let me just show you what he did. Let's average all of these sequences together. If we average out the percent identity weighted by the length of each match, we see that they drag the average down to 89.29%, which is pretty close to Tomkins' overall result of 88%. He seems to have just ignored the fact that he was matching the one human sequence onto many different chimpanzee sequences, which were clearly not the same. This is remarkable. How could he possibly have failed to notice this? Did he even glance over his results, or did he notice this and choose to go with it anyway? Because the overall results you were getting were too convenient. Now remember, not using max HSPS means you're reporting every partial match that exists in the alignment, which means that if you apply the lack of a max HSPS parameter of something to itself, like, oh, I don't know, a chunk of human chromosome to itself, you will not return a 100% percent identity because BLAST's P ident column is going to average all of those percent identities reported, all of those partial matches alongside the reasonable true match. Tompkins' Nookmer results were extremely similar to his BLAST results, which is exactly why I thought I was correct in the numbers that I was reporting. I wasn't using max HSPS, but neither was Tompkins, just not in his BLAST methodology, in his Nookmer methodology, which agreed and corroborated his BLAST stuff. I felt a lot better about my mistake after seeing this, but then I thought, 
What about the last Z stuff? What's going on there? That percent similarity is even lower than both Blast and Nookmer. But Glenn hadn't run anything in Last Z. He'd never really tested anything within it before because, again, he already had Tompkins over a barrel with the Blast stuff and with the Nookmer stuff. So I took a page from Brian's book, and I just went ahead and emailed the Last Z guy, Dr. Bob Harris from Penn State. I went ahead and sent him Tompkins' paper in addition to all of my questions, and he sent me back an extremely helpful deconstruction of basically everything wrong with Tompkins' last Z parameters. But suffice it to say, learning about last Z was very fun, and I shared some of my newfound knowledge with Glenn, and together we each independently ran our own tests, and um, would you be surprised if I told you that inputting Tompkins' parameters results in max HSPS being infinite, aka no max HSPS1, meaning using last Z, you will not get a 100% similarity of something to itself using Tompkins' methods. So here's my results for that, my last Z results, and this took forever. So I would love to go through and do a ton of last Z analyses, but it's honestly just very time consuming, especially for the point that I'm trying to make, which I think this does a decent enough doing on its own. So you'll see that we did like 10,000 base pairs each. So we started from uh, 10,000 to 20,000, 20,000 to 30,000, 30,000 to 40,000, et cetera, et cetera, um, all the way up to 11,000. And what you'll see is that, again, we're comparing a chunk of human chromosome 22 to itself. So you should expect that there should be 100% matches. And of course we see that 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%, 100%. But what if you did what Tompkins did? What if you took the average percent identity for like the whole alignment process? Well, let's do it. Equals average, and then we'll take our percent column here, uh, 72%. Well, 73%. Now, I never would have figured any of this out for myself if it hadn't had been for Dr. Carter's video dunking on me for being unable to recapitulate my work. Uh, so thank you for that, Dr. Carter. But can we please appreciate what Tompkins has actually done here? He has effectively three different methodologies that are all wrong in their own way, in such a way, so as to appear to corroborate one another. I'm just going to speak for myself here, but that is the most sus thing I have ever seen in my life in something that is posing as academic. I'd like to note here that I actually did rerun all my original comparisons, the ones without Max HSPS, using Tompkins' actual 2011 to 2015 parameters. And the results using his own methods show that humans and chimps are still more similar than animal pairs that creationists would insist are related, such as lions and lynx, baboons and macaques, and cows and water buffalo. My favorite was the mouse and rat comparison, because according to evolutionary theory, these two diverged in the distant past especially compared to all of these other pairs of organisms. So it's expected that despite extreme morphologic similarity, their genetic similarity should be more divergent. And of course, that's what we see. But mice and rats being different kinds is going to be a difficult sell. This is obviously extremely problematic to the young earth creationist idea of created kinds, a concept that I dismantle piece by piece in this video. By the way, Dr. Carter, if you do end up watching this, I'd like to know why you skipped that entire concept within my video. No matter how you slice it, humans and chimpanzees are closer to one another than many animals that you yourself accept as related. So how then do you determine your created kinds? Can you? You certainly can't with genetics, and you can't with morphology either. This is part of why I don't trust Rob Carter. He is extremely selective about what he chooses to cover in my video, avoiding many of the topics that are, in my opinion, lethal to young earth creationism. So let's really quickly summarize Dr. Carter's criticisms of my attempt to recapitulate Jeffrey Tompkins' work. The first, remember, had to do with waiting. Carter criticized me and Glenn alike for pointing to not waiting 
evaluating by sequence length as the main issue with Tompkins' 2018 work. The second criticism had to do with gapped versus ungapped, and Carter points out that, brutally speaking, gapped is going to return higher, not lower percent similarities than gapped, which is the opposite of what I reported in my YouTube video. And three, Carter was not able to recreate my results, specifically where Tompkins' parameters couldn't return a 100% similarity of something to itself. Criticism one, I think that's pretty well unfounded. Carter effectively agreed with Glenn and I that however Tompkins was weighting was incorrect and then he posed what he felt to be a better type of weighting as well as more complete reasoning for why you have to wait by sequence length. But after talking to a lot of comparative geneticists on this one, I feel pretty comfortable saying that in the context of comparative genomics, you absolutely have to consider sequence length when you're coming up with overall percent identities. And when you get right down to it, this criticism of Carter's could basically be boiled down to him saying, it's not that simple. You don't just always wait by sequence length, dot, dot, dot. But yeah, Tompkins should have waited by sequence length. Criticism two, where gapped is always going to give a lower, not a higher percent similarity than ungapped, I think was well supported by the experiments that Carter ran. And brutally, as I said previously, this is in fact true and something I didn't appreciate in my video. But Carter actually fell into the same trap that I did and didn't fully understand the argument that Glenn Williamson was actually making. And in truth, ungapped is still ultimately the reason as to why Tompkins' numbers are in fact erroneous. It is just the combination of using the ungapped parameter with his bizarre weighting scheme that leads him to error. So on that one, I'm fine to wear the humility hat and cop to an incomplete, aka a wrong explanation for why Tompkins' methodology is incorrect, but I think by that same logic, Carter has to cop to the same thing and eat a little crow here for not actually grasping what Glenn's argument was. And I think this is especially the case with Carter since he was seeking to actually fundamentally debunk Glenn Williamson's argument here. He did have access to that paper and Glenn has reached out to him personally. Three, his criticism that he couldn't recreate my results, he gets kind of partial credit for. I mean, he couldn't recreate them, but I truly do think he could have found out the reason for that if he'd read in depth like I was forced to do and seen, in fact, that my parameters were for an older version of BLAST where max HSPS1 was actually the default. I think he probably could have sussed that out. I mean, if I could do it, he could probably do it too. Ultimately, I get credit for this one for pointing out that I was wrong. But this is also a tricky one because this is what ultimately led me to being roundaboutly right. Because actually Tompkins doesn't use max HSPS in the other two methods that he uses alongside BLAST. Meaning all of those original numbers are valid again, including the human chromosome not being 100% identical to itself using Tompkins' parameters. So was Carter's criticism series good? Yeah, I think so. I mean, he pointed out stuff that I got wrong, and of course I'm happy to sit here and take responsibility for that. I'm not a geneticist after all, I do comparative morphology on ancient Miocene apes. That's my specialty. So I was really stepping out of my comfort zone here, and I'm willing to admit when I make mistakes in that light and hopefully every other light. I never want to be the type of person that can't admit when I've made a mistake. However, I do think it is extremely interesting that Carter chose to spend the majority of this video talking about the mistakes that I made instead of the much more foundational mistakes made by Jeffrey Tompkins, especially considering the difference between Jeff and I as people and as professionals. I'm a graduate student and not one in genetics. Making mistakes is going to be part of the learning process at my stage, again, especially when it's outside of my field of expertise. But Jeffrey Tompkins is a geneticist, a real bona fide geneticist who published these results in a journal that would allow him to because it has a young earth creationist slant, but he would have published them anywhere if he could. He published those results from 2011 all the way to 2018, almost a decade of work. Each one has significant mistakes. Each one has mistakes that someone as layman as I can see with my own two eyes. And each one of them went along with no real change. And it took me, a non-professional making a YouTube video about the mistakes that Tompkins made, 
like almost half a decade after the fact to get any other young earth creationist to actually look at it and admit that there are in fact mistakes here, mistakes that have gone years without correction. Everyone who has looked at Tompkins' work in depth knows that he has made mistakes here. I made mistakes in my coverage of it, but I owned up to them immediately. Right when I saw my mistakes were made, I started scripting for this video where I was going to cop to my mistakes and then fix them. But not for Tompkins. No, he's just been doubling, tripling, quadrupling down over and over and over again for years. And I can't help but wonder if the only reason Carter decided to cover this was because my video got so popular. So many people were noticing and so many people now have the ability to shut down the Tompkins number right out the gate. I don't think that that is appropriate as a reason for finally deciding to own up to an error in your camp, as it were. I mean, Dr. Carter's channel is pretty dang small. I didn't have to respond to that video. I could have just kept merrily along, being wrong in my heart, and hoping that no one ever pointed it out, like who was popular or more popular than me. But like, that would be an insane and horrible thing to do, academically bankrupt. So as painful as it was, I set out to respond and correct my mistake. It's a happy coincidence that Tompkins just so happened to get busted even more in the process. And I just think it's really interesting that a lot of time was spent covering my mistakes when ultimately Carter agreed with me. So we've covered the criticisms that Carter really has of me in this video. The remainder of the video he spends trying to answer the question, how similar are humans and chimpanzees? And we're gonna put a pin in that because this video is almost three hours long. I'm gonna save that for uh, another video that's coming very shortly. But I wanna skip to the end on something Carter says about the nature of being wrong. And it's directed at me, so let's work through this. I've known for my Myself that when one has to eat crow, that crow is even extra bitter when it comes with a healthy dose of snark. See, when you go all out on a limb and, and attack someone and destroy someone's reputation and whatever, telling you're wrong, you're dumb, whatever, and then you make mistakes of your own, oh man, that's humiliating. So I'm assuming he's talking about me going after Tompkins here, given the mistakes that I made. So I hope I've cleared some things up for you here, Dr. Carter, with regard to what I got wrong and what I didn't get wrong, and how none of that actually impacts the entire conclusion that you reached and the one that I reached in the original video, which is that Tompkins is still incorrect in every aspect of every study he has done on this subject. You are right though, it sucks to be wrong about something. That's why I started the video this way. You see we're coming full circle. But here I am sitting here on camera for my thousands of viewers, more than that these days, which I'm, I'm happy to see, owning it. I was wrong about something, you guys, and Carter pointed it out, a young earth creationist busted guts a given, wow. But it's like I said in the beginning, making mistakes gives us opportunity to learn and improve. And so, I relish in them. They hurt, but I relish in them. So, are, are we mature enough to handle this? I'm not attacking you, notice. I didn't call you girl, I didn't try to diminish your reputation or anything. No, I wouldn't do that. So, I want it on record, I think Carter did a good job with this response video. I think that he was civil, I think that he was, for the most part, pretty appropriate. Uh, but I will point out here, I don't think that it's doing anybody, like, a favor not to call them girl, which is what Tompkins did, right? He was like, oh, some girl made this, you know, uh, debunk of me and it's nonsense and whatever. And I mean, like, as a 27-year-old woman, that's a little bit condescending, to be perfectly honest. So I don't know that it's like, oh, thank you for meeting the bare minimum, Dr. Carter, and referring to me as, like, a person. Like, I don't know that you get to be commended for doing what is expected of you as, like, a a fellow scientist, but the rest is true. He asks Dan how he ranks in his eyes now and like comes after Dapper Dinosaur a little bit. And I was like, yep, okay, here it comes, buddy, take this. He finishes off the video by saying he feels pretty strongly about his arguments and he gives us a call to action on like, let's figure this out. Let's find out how similar are humans and chimps really and let's see perhaps what's wrong with my program or you know where else i went wrong or how his program fares in my eyes or the eyes of other people who have looked at it i do not think i'm lying i do not think i'm wrong i don't think i made any mistakes i was as careful as i could be but i can make mistakes all right everybody 
Let's go. Let's figure this out. Now, Carter does some interesting comparisons of his own. Like, the last third odd of the video is just him coming to the conclusion that he comes to you for how similar are humans and chimps really. And I'll give you a hint, like, that number is pretty close to the conventional number, but I really want to dig into that on its own. I want to talk about how similar humans and chimpanzees are and, like, how Carter's particular analysis bears on young Earth creationism alongside how Tompkins' particular analysis bore on young Earth creationism. But looking at the first video and the first two-thirds of the second video, encompassing the majority of Carter's series, I think we can all come to a singular conclusion that, at the very least, Jeffrey Tompkins is definitely wrong, and I made a couple of mistakes of my own in my previous analysis. I owned up to and corrected those mistakes here, and so the question and remains, Will Tompkins? And that got me thinking, if the same thing were to happen to Carter, or, or any even muted or abbreviated version of being wrong about something and then being shown that you were incorrect, would Carter own up to his mistakes? Carter's video reminded me how dangerous it can be to step outside of your field of expertise and be subject to the criticism of those whose field it belongs, and then I wondered, like, I wonder if Carter, as a young Earth creationist, has ever spoken outside of his field. I found out that he had, in fact, spoken outside of his field. And very occasionally, he talks about things like human evolution. And I thought to myself, let's do another little experiment. My gentle and of course very modern apes, if you like what I do, please consider supporting me in the free way, which is liking, commenting, and subscribing. And if you want to do more than that, you can join my Patreon. Patrons get their names at the end of the video, and every now and again, they get, like, early access to videos. But it's rare, don't count on it, and in the meantime, you guys, I really hope to see you in the next one.